of my chinese marriage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by danielle cartwright my chinese marriage by may fran king in america i saw chan king liang for the first time on a certain monday morning in october it was the opening day of college and the preceding week had been filled with the excitement incidental to the arrival of many students in a small town given over to family life every household possessed of a spare room was impressed with the fact that good citizenship demanded that it harbor a student therefore when i saw trunks and boxes and bags being tumbled upon the front tumbled upon the front porch of our next door neighbor i said to mother mrs james has succumbed and set out for my first class with celia an old friend as we crossed the campus we noticed a group of boys gathered on the steps of college hall and talking among themselves celia turned to me do you see the one with the very black hair his face turned away a little the one in the gray suit margaret well that is the new chinese student and the boys all say he is a wonder my cousin knew him last year in chicago where he was a freshman going in for international law and political science imagine i turned and glanced with a faint interest at the foreign student on whose black hair the sun was shining my first impression was of a very young smiling lad looks well enough i said rather ungraciously and we passed on i was a busy student eagerly beginning my freshman year's work and i thought no more of the young chinese but a day or so later i discovered him to be the owner of those trunks and bags i had seen assembled on mrs james's porch chang king was my next door neighbor we were never introduced to each other as it happened and though we shared studies in german and french we did not exchange a word for some time i found myself admiring his feat of learning two foreign languages through the medium of english a third and doing it so very well at the same time though i was not then aware of the fact he was also admiring me for proficiency in these subjects in which i was working hard because i intended to teach languages the progress of my interest in him was gradual and founded on a sense of his complete remoteness an utter failure to regard him as a human being like the rest of us he was the first of his race i had ever seen but finally we spoke to one another by some chance and after that it seemed unnecessary to refuse to walk to class with him on a certain morning when we came out of our houses at the same moment we parted at college hall door with an exchange of informal little nods i was happily impressed but my impulse to friendship suffered a quick reaction from all that chang king was when viewed against the background of his race as i saw it i had no intention whatever of continuing our association naturally chang king knew nothing of this i think i was probably a trifle more courteous to him than was necessary i remember being uneasy for fear of wounding him by some thoughtless remark that would reveal my true state of mind about china i lost sight of the race in the individual i even pretended not to notice that he was waiting for me morning after morning when i emerged always a trifle late hurrying to classes by the close of the first semester we were making the trip together almost daily as a matter of course he was gay and friendly with a sort of frank joyousness that was his own special endowment for living i enjoyed his companionship his talk his splendid spirit his cheerfulness was a continual stimulant to my moody introspective static temperament i used to study his face which in repose had the true oriental impassivity a stillness that suggested an inner silence or brooding 
but this mood was rare in those days and i remember best his laughter his shining eyes that never missed the merriment to be had from the day's routine events for a while we were merely two very conventional young students walking sedately together talking with eagerness on what now seemed amusingly sober and carefully chosen subjects we were both determined to be dignified and impersonal i was nineteen and chang king was two years older finally chang king asked to call and he appeared at the door that evening laden with an enormous irregular package a collection of treasures that he thought might interest us we all gathered about the library table where he spread a flaming array of embroidered silks carved ivory and sandalwood and curious little images in bronze and blackwood they gave out a delicious fragrance spicy and warm and sweet with a bitter tang to it a mingling of oils and lacquers and dust of incense he was very proud of half a dozen neckties his mother had made him patterned carefully after the american one he had sent her as a souvenir she sews a great deal and everything she does is beautiful he said stroking one of the ties fashioned of wine-coloured silk and embroidered in thin gold thread the simple words the tangle of the exotic things lying on the table in that moment set the whole world between us i saw him as alien far removed and unknowable i realized how utterly transplanted he must be moving as he did in a country whose ideals manners and customs must appear at times grotesquely fantastic to him how queer we must seem to you i exclaimed impulsively lifting a solid fat little idol in my hand queer not at all but wonderfully interesting in everything you see to me it is all one world our eyes met for a second then he offered me a small embroidered chinese flag i hesitated looking at the writhing fire-breathing dragon done in many-coloured silks again the old prejudice swept over me i was about to refuse but i saw in his eyes an expression of hesitating half-anxious pleading which touched me i took the flag puzzled a trifle over that look i had surprised Chen King became a frequent visitor at our home in the evenings, making friends with my father and mother with true Chinese deference. I like to remember those times, with all of us sitting around the big table, the shaded lamp casting a clear circle of light on the books and papers, the rest of the room in pleasant dimness. It was during these evenings that Chen King told us about his father, typical chinese product of his clan and time who had early perceived the limitations of a too nationalistic point of view and had planned western education for his sons of whom chen king was the eldest from his talk i reconstructed a half picture of his home in southern china it was a large household of brothers and relatives and servants ruled over by his mother during the prolonged absences of his father whose business interests lay in a faraway island port once he brought a faded photograph of a small boy formally arrayed in the chinese velvets and satins of an earlier period myself at age of six he explained i examined the picture closely why mr liang i said in wonder you are wearing a wearing a cue he smiled delighted at my confusion yes a very nice cue it was he declared bound with a scarlet silk cord i remember how it waved in the wind when i flew my kite on the hills you wore a black cue yourself margaret interposed my mother her eyes twinkling shorter than this but often tied with a red silk ribbon you see we had that in common at least said chang king and he flashed a grateful smile at mother there was a well-established friendship between my kindly understanding mother and chang king while my feeling for him was still uncertain 
yet in spite of all these reasons for close sympathy with chang king i felt toward him at times something amounting almost to dislike against such states of mind my personal sense of justice a trait i had directly from my scotch inheritance instantly rebelled i was careful in no way to reveal my feelings though i probably should have done so had i even remotely realized that friendship was verging upon love as it was i had an ideal of genuine comradeship of a pleasant interlude destined to end with our college days toward the end of the winter as our acquaintance advanced there came to me a series of those revulsions i assured myself that so ephemeral a relation as ours must be was hardly worth the time i was giving to it i remembered that fine as chang king was he belonged to the chinese race i decided to put an end to the entire episode at once the way in which i carried out this plan was unnecessarily abrupt i avoided him unmistakably going to class and returning home by a roundabout way and refusing to see him either in class or on the campus then one afternoon at the end of two weeks he was waiting for me before the main door of college hall i did not speak he joined me without a word and walked in silence to the campus edge i turned suddenly toward a side street go that way if you like i said rudely i have an errand this way he came with me i wish to talk with you he said with an oddly restrained patient tone of weariness our eyes met and i saw in his a gentle and touching determination to understand and be understood which would have been more significant to me if i had been less engrossed in my own emotions why do you wish to end our friendship he asked quietly with his characteristic frankness i because i thought it was best i stammered completely disarmed it is never best to give up a friendship he said but it happens that our friendship may end soon after all it is possible i shall return to china to-day i received a cablegram from my father saying my mother is dangerously ill i shall know within a day or so whether i am to go or to stay human sympathy triumphed over race prejudice come home with me i said and let mother talk to you she always knows what to say another cablegram two days later brought the good news of his mother's improvement chang king's anxiety during those two days wrung me he said nothing but his face was strained and lined he walked and we talked a good deal of other things and he gave me definite outlines of his life plan as he called it he regarded the diplomatic service of his country as his final goal but on the way to it he wished to take part in constructive teaching and sociological work in china he was keenly enthusiastic about the ancient arts and natural beauties of china and venerated many of her old customs i hope introducing modern education will not destroy the beauty of the east he told me but he was solidly convinced of the need for new ideas in all the orient i began to see his country through new eyes we were soon going about together a great deal i remember many happy parties on the lantern-lighted campus many field days and tennis matches all the innocent freedom of college life that we enjoyed together I was rather remote in my personal friendships, and very little was said to me regarding my association with the Chinese student. But now I began to hear small murmurs, a vague hum of discussion, and to observe an interested watching of us by the students and townspeople. I could not help seeing that curious glances followed us when we entered a tea-room or concert hall together several friends of my mother's spoke disapprovingly to her of the matter 
what if they should fall in love marry asked one conventional-minded old lady but my mother was born without prejudices and never sees boundary lines or nationalities she was infinitely tactful and kind i now know that she was rather uneasy for she felt that marriage is a difficult enough relation when each person knows the other's heritage and formulas but she said nothing to make me self-conscious not even repeating the remarks of her acquaintances until long afterward however i heard comments from other sources which irritated me a trifle and had the perfectly natural effect of stimulating my loyalty to chang king and arousing at times a yearning tenderness to shield him from injustice at this time we tentatively expressed our views on intermarriage we were sitting on the porch late one afternoon i believe marriage between alien races is a mistake i said in a decisive way i cultivated at that time it is better to marry one's own kind no doubt there are fewer difficulties he answered without conviction it is all so much a personal problem marriages between americans do not seem to be always successful i flared we hear only of the unhappy ones i retorted but there are many many unhappy ones then he returned gently i wonder if unhappy marriage in all countries is not due to selfishness and lack of love and to unwillingness to compromise on unimportant differences we could not possibly quarrel here and our talk proceeded amiably my thoughts at dinner that night seem very amusing to me as i recall them now Chan king was so like one of us as we sat at the table together that i found myself wondering if it was true that a chinese wife did not eat at the same table with her husband if she actually did wait upon him and obey him without question in everything if chang king would return to china soon and there become an insufferable autocratic eastern husband the thought oppressed me unbearably since chang king was leaving next day on a summer vacation trip this was a farewell dinner he insisted on helping me with the dishes afterward for ours was a simple household and we usually had no maid we were very merry over the task in china he confided as he stacked the saucers the lot of women is much easier they have servants for everything of this kind i know an english woman who married a chinese and she afterward taught in a college for the sake of something to do she did quite right i said idleness is not good for any one chinese wives are not idle he answered gravely they have many duties for every one in their household at this he turned his eyes upon me with an intent inner look because i was impressed i chose to be flippant if i obstruct your view i will move i said it would do no good he answered you are always there wherever i want to look later he was writing his name in chinese characters on a photograph he had given my mother i stood beside him he dropped the pen turned to me and took both my hands in his own he bent toward me and i drew away shaking my head decisively i wrenched one hand free and the kiss he meant for my lips reached my fingers instead i was overwhelmed with a sense of invasion we quarrelled but without bitterness or real anger i was simply convinced that since love was not for us we were bound by all ethics to keep our relations in the outward seeming of friendship for a moment i felt that one of my ideals had been rudely shattered oh but you have mistaken me he declared earnestly refusing to release my hand kisses are not for friendship i managed to say i'm sorry he confessed 
but i saw in his eyes that he regretted my misunderstanding of him nothing more during his summer travels he wrote me many letters i had time to think and in my thoughts i admitted that to be a friend to cheng king was better than to have the love of any one else in the world when he returned we wandered together one evening down to the campus and sat on a stone bench in the moonshade of a tall tree i had overheard a remark tinged with race prejudice that had awakened again in my heart that brooding maternal tenderness and when chang king's eyes pleaded wistfully i gave him as a sacrificial offering the kiss before denied that fall he transferred for a year to a new england university he told me long afterward that it was so that absence might teach me to know my own heart i loved him now and admitted it to myself with bitter honesty but all fulfillment of love seemed so hopeless and remote the chasm fixed between our races seemed so impassable that i gave up in my heart and put away his letters as they came smiling with affected youthful cynicism at the memory of that kiss which could mean nothing more to us than a sweet and troubled recollection he came back unexpectedly at the end of the college term there was an indescribably hopeful anxious look in his eyes as he took my hands my first sight of his face grown older and graver in those long months brought a shock of poignant happiness very near to tears off guard we met as lovers with all antagonisms momentarily swept away all pretenses forgotten i went to his arms as my one sure haven for this hour love made everything simple and happy my mother and father were astonished when we told them of our intention to marry with gentle wisdom mother suggested that we allow ourselves a year of engagement in order to be sure as she expressed it we were very sure but we consented chang king wrote at once to his people in south china telling of his engagement for me he had one important explanation made in his frank straightforward way in china he told me it is usual for parents to arrange their children's marriages often years in advance when i was very young it was generally understood that i would later marry the daughter of my father's good friend three years younger than i there was no formal betrothal and when i left home to study i asked my father not to make any definite plans for my marriage until my return the subject has never been mentioned since and i don't know what his ideas are now but they can make no difference with us you understand that margaret dear again i felt myself in spiritual collision with unknown forces and wondered at his calmness in opposing the claims of his heredity his family replied to his letter with a cablegram forbidding the marriage i had never seriously expected any other decision a letter followed conciliatory in tone in which his father explained that since chang king's foreign education was nearly completed arrangements had been made for his marriage to miss li ying immediately upon his return home he gave a charming description of his bride whom chang king had not seen for twelve years she was he said young and modest and kind she was beautiful and wealthy and moreover had been given a modern education in order to fit her for the position of wife to an advanced chinese the match was greatly desired by both families in conclusion the letter urgently requested that chang king would not make it impossible for his father to fulfil the contract he had entered into with a friend and very gently intimated that by so doing he would forfeit all right to further consideration there were other letters an american friend a missionary wrote oh very tactfully of the difficulties he would have in keeping an american wife happy in the orient 
a chinese cousin discussed at length the sorrows of a foreign daughter-in-law would bring into his house the bitterness of having in the family an alien and stubborn woman who would be unwilling to give his parents the honour due them or to render them the service they would expect of their son's wife many letters of this kind came in a group there was a hopeless tone of finality a solid clan consciousness in those letters that frightened me a little i was uneasy uncertain i had found no irreconcilable elements in our minds for i was very conservative west and he was very liberal east but here were represented the people with whom his life must be spent and the social background against which it must harmoniously unfold i felt with terrific force that it was not chang king but chang king's traditions and ancestors his tremendous racial past that i must reckon with also i did not wish to stand in the way of his future i doubt if i could have found courage to marry chang king if i had then realized the importance especially in diplomatic and political circles of clan and family influence in china but he gave it up so freely with such assured and unregretful cheerfulness that i could not but share his mood in these calm logical impersonal family letters which cheng king translated for me there was a strain of sinister philosophy that chilled me as i read the letters dealt entirely with his duty in many phases to his parents to his ancestors to his country to his own future nothing of love only one relative a cousin mentioned it at all and in this wise you are young now and to youth love seems of great importance but as age replaces youth you will find that love runs away like water that is not true cheng king i said with solemn conviction love is greater than life or age it lives beyond death it is love that makes eternity at this time cheng king did not quite comprehend my mystical interpretation of love but he answered very happily to have you for my wife is worth everything else the world can offer cheng king continued to write to his family briefly and respectfully declining to be influenced in any way replies came at lengthening intervals and then ceased there was no open breach no violent tearing asunder of bonds courteously quite gently the hands of his people were removed and he stood alone but surely your mother will not give you up i exclaimed one day when it dawned on me that not one message had she sent in all the correspondence not in her dear heart he said with unshaken faith but of course she will not write to me if my father disapproves but a mother chang king i protested surely her feelings come first always chang king's tone was patient after the manner of one who has explained an obvious fact many times in china he reminded me again the family comes always before the individual but with you and me margaret beloved love has first importance his never-failing insistence upon viewing ours as an individual instance not to be judged by any ordinary standards was a source of great strength to me always during the short period that followed before our marriage we tiffed a few times in the most conventional manner with fits of jealousy that had no foundation small distrusts that on my part were merely efforts to uphold what i considered my proper feminine pride and on his were often failures to discount this characteristic temper of mine only somehow there was never any rancor in our quarrels not once would we deny our love for each other so we planned to be married immediately there were no reasons why we should delay further 
that is to say none but practical reasons and what have they to do with young people in love it is a little late for us to begin practical thinking said chang king cheerfully when we discussed ways and means but we might as well make the experiment chang king was no longer merely a student with a generous allowance from a wealthy father on his own resources with his education not completed he was about to acquire a foreign wife and to face an untried world we were strangely light-hearted about all this chang king had regularly put by more than half of his allowance since coming to america i meant to be a teacher of languages economically independent if circumstances required such aid for a man beginning a career our plans were soon completed at the end of another term which we would finish together chang king would be graduated and then after a year of practice in his profession he would return to china there to begin his life work i was to follow later nothing could have been more delightfully simple so far as we could see a few days later we were married in my mother's house by an anglican clergyman of course you will live here with us until you go to china my parents had said we want our children with us if you can be happy here this seemed a very natural arrangement to chang king accustomed as he was to family life but i was apprehensive the popular western idea that people cannot be friends if they are related by law was heavy on my mind i did not expect any drastic readjustment of temperament between my chinese husband and me but i did look forward somewhat timorously to a trying period of small complications due to differences in domestic customs and the routine of daily living i need not have worried a moment a wonderful spirit of family cooperation was an important part of chang king's oriental heritage from the day of our wedding he took his place with charming ease and naturalness as a member of the household the affection that existed between my husband and my parents simplified that phase of our relation perfectly and left us free to adjust ourselves to each other and the world though the latter we took very little into account until i met chang king the idea of being conspicuous was unendurable to me but when i early perceived that to appear with him anywhere was to invite the gaze of the curious i discovered with surprise that it mattered not at all i was very proud of my husband and loved to go about with him we were happy from the beginning discovering life together proved a splendid adventure which renewed itself daily the deep affection and tenderness between us created subtle comprehensions too delicate to be put into words a quick look interchanged during a pause in talk would often convey a complete thought i always felt that chang king had acuter perceptions more reserve and more imagination than i also he was meticulous as i was not in regard to small amenities i had always been used to having my own way without causing discomfort to any one else but i found that i could not speak carelessly or act thoughtlessly without the risk of violating his sense of the fitness of things my greatest difficulty in the first few months of our marriage came from my constant effort to adjust my mode of thought and action to meet a highly trained and critical temperament to whom the second bests of association spiritual or mental or material were not acceptable yet if he exacted much he gave more in everything he had a generosity so sincere and spontaneous that it aroused a like quality in me i am in many ways the elemental type of woman requiring i know a certain measure of domination in love it was imperative that i respect my husband and it pleased me to discover in our several slight domestic crises 
that his was far the stronger will i had taken my vow to obey having specified that the word was not to be omitted from the marriage ceremony how i should have kept it under a tyrannical will i do not know for cheng king was not a domestic dictator he took it for granted that we were partners and equals in our own departments of life he trusted my judgment in the handling of my share of our affairs and in later years often came to me for advice in his own nevertheless morally the balance of power was in his hands and i was glad to leave it there often our disagreements would end in laughter because each one of us would give way gradually from the position first assumed until we had almost changed sides in the discussion this happened again and again from the very beginning i saw clearly by some grace the point at which chang king's oriental mind and occidental education came into the keenest conflict my attitude toward other men and their attitude toward me he was never meanly jealous or suspicious but there was in him that unconquerable eastern sense of exclusiveness in love that cherishing of personal possession so incomprehensible to the average western imagination i had planned to instruct a young man in french during the summer months as a part of my vacation work and i casually announced my intention to cheng king he opposed it at once i thought unfairly i was a great while persuading him to admit his real reasons for objecting finally i said somewhat at random if my pupil were a girl you would not care you have enough work as it is he persisted but without firmness and his eyes flickered away from mine i laughed a little he turned to me a face so distressed that my smile died suddenly oh don't laugh he said painfully in earnest you must keep in mind what you are to me i cannot be different i am sorry i gave up my harmless young pupil and said nothing more from that moment i began to form my entire code of conduct where men were concerned on a rigidly impersonal and formal basis it was not difficult for my first and only affection was centred in my husband and the impulse to coquetry was foreign to my nature my husband's determination to leave my individuality untrammelled was sometimes overborne in small ways that delighted me by his innate sense of fitness we played tennis and he played excellently one day as we left the courts he said to me tennis just isn't your game margaret your dignity is always getting in the way of your drive i don't want you to give up your dignity it is too much of you but you might leave tennis alone and try archery i am sure that is more suited to your type the amused obedience with which i took his suggestion soon became enthusiasm for the new sport to me marriage has always seemed the most mystic and important of human relations involving at times all the rest and particularly parenthood i am a born mother to whom the idea of marriage without children is unthinkable since i put away my dolls dream children had taken their place in the background of my fancy i saw them vaguely at first but with the coming of love i knew quite clearly how they would look now that i had married chang king i should have liked a child at once as a surer bond between us and as a source of comfort for myself when he should be making his start in china i knew that he loved children for on several occasions i had deliberately put a tiny neighbor in his way and had taken note of his warm friendliness and gentleness to the wee thing but fearing that he would be unwilling to accept a new responsibility while our affairs were still unsettled i put aside my desire for a child though my loved books were growing strangely irksome i did not know that my husband shared the usual foreign belief that the american woman is an unwilling mother 
then one day he went to call on a friend of his a chinese student whose wife and little son were with him i saw the chinese baby he told me with boyish eagerness he is going to have a little brother soon lucky baby lucky parents i corrected him and sighed enviously chang king looked at me the wonder on his face growing into a delighted smile do you mean it margaret he asked incredulously then we talked long and earnestly of our children to chang king's old world mind children should follow marriage as naturally as fruit the blossom and his happiness in discovering that my ideals were exactly his own brought us to another plane of understanding and contentment with each other besides he explained a grandchild would do much to reconcile his parents to our marriage happily when the school term was over i put aside my books for a needle i had always been fond of sewing but never had i found such fascinating work as the making of those tiny garments of silk and flannel and lawn my practical mother protested against so much embroidering but my husband only smiled as he rummaged gently through the basket of small sewing you are a real chinese wife after all he would say a chinese wife sews and embroiders a great deal she even makes shoes for the family shoes chang king shoes no less to make shoes beautifully is a fine art and a Chinese woman takes pride in excelling at it. She is proud of her feet and makes all her own slippers. Then he would tell me stories of his childhood and recall memories of the closed garden in his old home where he played at battledore with a tiny girl while her mother and his mother sat together embroidering and talking in low tones. The two young mothers were friends, and were planning for the marriage of their son and daughter, which would strengthen the friendship into a family bond. I took great interest in this little girl who flitted through Chang King's stories like a brilliant butterfly seen through a mist. Her name was Li Ying, and she was only three years old when she ran, with her little feet still unbound, through those sweetly remembered green gardens of his childhood somewhere now she was sitting her lily feet meekly crossed embroidering shoes waiting until her father should betroth her to another youth when chang king showed me a portrait of himself taken in a group with his mother and father when he was eight years old i examined very thoughtfully the austerely beautiful face of the woman who had brought him into life she sat on one side of the carved blackwood table her narrow panelled skirt was raised a trifle to show her amazingly tiny feet on the other side of the table sat chang king's father an irreconcilably stern and autocratic looking man magnificently garbed in the old style beside him stood a small solemn boy wearing a round cap his queue still bound he told me with a red cord his hands lost in the long velvet sleeves that reached almost to his knees. I put a finger on the head of this boy. I hope our son will look exactly like him, I said. At last the hoped-for son was born, and laid in my arms. He was swaddled and powdered and new, and he wept for obscure reasons but my husband and I smiled joyfully at the delicious, incredible resemblance of that tiny face to his own. Chen King looked at him a long time, a quizzical, happy smile in the corners of his mouth. Then he kissed me very gently and said, "'He's a real Liang baby, Margaret. Are you glad?' I answered that I was glad, as I had been for everything love had brought to me." our plans progressed favorably and when our son wilfred was five months old chang king returned to china i told him good-bye in the way i knew would please him most calmly and without tears but when it came to the last moment i felt unable to let him go 
Mutely I clung to him, the baby on my arm between us. "'It won't be for long this,' he assured me. "'We shall all be together at home very soon. "'You are brave and dear and true, Margaret. "'You shall never be made sorry. "'Be patient.' His first letters told of his new work in one of the older colleges for which Shanghai is famous. He also began his practice of law in an official capacity. His first step toward the diplomatic service had been taken. At the end of four months I received his summons, and went about making ready for the journey to China with my young son. My life-work was to help my husband in making a home. His life work was in China. The conclusion was so obvious that neither I nor my parents had ever questioned it. But now that the moment had come, the friends of the family were very much excited. They asked strange questions. Are you really going? How can you leave your mother? How can you give up beautiful America? Aren't you afraid to go to China? I answered as patiently and reasonably as I could. They wearied me very much. Of China itself I had no clear conception, in spite of Chang King's letters, for though my old prejudice had passed away, yet still I saw all the country only as a background for my husband's face. I followed Chang King's minute instructions concerning travelling arrangements, and Wilfred and I had a pleasant voyage. Early one morning I looked through the porthole and saw about me the murky waters of the Yangtze, alive with native craft, while dimly through the mist loomed the fortifications of Wu Sing. Already the tender was waiting, and soon we were aboard, moving rapidly up the mouth of the river. The mist cleared, green banks arose on each side, and through distant trees gleamed red brick buildings, like any at home side by side with the white plastered walls and tip-tilted roofs of china in that long ride shanghai grew upon me gradually a curious mixture of the known and the unknown tantalizing me with the feeling that i had seen all this before and ought to remember it better in the water about me steamer launch and battleship mingled with native junk river barge and houseboat. Suddenly, in the waiting group on the customs jetty, I saw my husband. In another moment we had drawn alongside the wharf, and he was in the tender, beside me, greeting me in the formally courteous manner he deemed suited to public occasions. Taking Wilfred in his arms, he drew me up the steps and to a waiting carriage. Here again was the confused mingling of the strange and the familiar. Clanging tram-cars, honking automobiles, smooth rolling rickshaws, creaking wheelbarrows, and lumbering man-drawn trucks. Dark, coolie faces under wide straw hats, gently bred features beneath pith-helmets. Black, bearded countenances below huge, gay turbans. A bewildering jumble of alien and English speech. Even in Chang King I found it. He was wearing American dress. His face had not changed, the tones of his voice were the same, but he was speaking Chinese, and his directions to the Mafu were to me a meaningless succession of sounds. But when he was beside me in the carriage, and the horses had started, he turned suddenly and smiled straight into my eyes. Then Shanghai, Borneo, or the North Pole, all would have been one to me. I asked no questions. I was with my husband and child, driving rapidly toward the home prepared for me. I had come home to China. End of chapter 1「Of My Chinese Marriage」by May Fran King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Shanghai My first impressions of Shanghai are a blur. 
my husband and i drove rapidly along the bund along garden bridge which might have been any bridge in america past astor house which was very like any american hotel and then along the su chow creek which could be only in china on north sichuan road we stopped at a lee or terrace of newly built houses in the style called semi-foreign this lee which was in the international settlement was very bright and clean it opened upon the main thoroughfare the heavy walls of bright red brick were interrupted at intervals at intervals by black doors bearing brass nameplates at one of these my husband stopped and touched a very american-looking push-button a bell trilled within and the door was opened by a smiling boy in a long blue cotton gown we crossed a small courtyard bright with flowers and vines and coming to the main entrance stepped directly into a large square room it was cool immaculate and restful the matting covered floors the skilfully arranged tables chairs and sofa the straight hangings of green and white threaded with gold were exactly what i should have wished to choose for myself i was pleasantly surprised by the gas chandelier with its shades of green and gold and white a dark green gas radiator along one wall suggested that shanghai was not always so warm as then it was a very modest little home befitting a man with his own way to make chan king explained as he led me through the rooms for a hasty survey when wilfred was surrendered to his amma a fresh-cheeked young woman in stiffly starched blue coat white trousers and apron while we made ready for a tiffin engagement with chinese friends of chan king's after a short rickshaw ride novel and delightful to me we turned from the main road into another series of terraces and entered a real chinese household the host and hostess who had both been in america and spoke excellent english were very cordial in their welcome i felt more at home than i had believed could be possible tiffin was served in the chinese fashion the guests seated at a great round table with the dishes of meat fish and vegetables placed in the centre so that each one could help himself as he chose individual bowls of rice small plates chopsticks and spoons were at each plate set at intervals were small shallow dishes containing soy mustard or ketchup and also roasted melon seeds and almonds when my hostess who had thoughtfully rounded out her delicious chinese menu with bread and butter and velvety ice cream as thoughtfully produced a silver knife and fork for me my husband explained that i was rather deft in the use of chopsticks though he had taught me during the early days of our marriage to use a slender ivory pair that he possessed i was now very nervous but i felt obliged to prove his delighted assertion so my social conformity as a chinese wife began there before a friendly and amused audience who assured me that i did very well on the way home chan king said will this be difficult for you margaret chopsticks i asked gaily well enough knowing that he did not mean chopsticks no i like them i mean everything he said very gravely china customs people homesickness everything you will see whether you haven't married a true oriental i answered him as for homesickness why chang king i am at home the most important thing at first materially speaking was that chan king must make his own way without help of any sort and for the upper-class chinese this is very difficult he was teaching advanced english in one of the largest colleges in shanghai maintaining a legal practice and giving lectures on international law he was glad to be at home again filled with enthusiasm for his work hopeful as the young returned students always are at first 
and through sheer inability to limit his endeavours working beyond his strength our happiness at being together again made all things seem possible from its fragmentary beginnings in america we gathered again into our hands the life we expected to make so full and rich my part i recognized was to be a genuinely old-fashioned wife the role i was best fitted for and the one most helpful to chen king and i began by running my chinese household with minute attention to providing for his comfort in small ways that he liked and never failed to appreciate our two-story house consisted of two big rooms downstairs and sleeping apartments and a tiny roof garden upstairs in this roof garden i spent most of my time and there wilfred and his amma passed many afternoons it was a pleasant sunny place furnished with painted steamer chairs rugs and blooming plants in pottery jars at the back rather removed from the main part of the house were the kitchen servants quarters and an open-air laundry we were really very practical and modern and comfortable our kitchen provided for an admirable compromise between old and new methods it had an english gas range and a chinese one but the proper chinese atmosphere was preserved by three well-trained servants who called themselves a ching a ling and a po most shanghai servants are simply called boy or ama or coolie but ours chose those names as distinctive for servants there as james and bridget are with us Ah Ching did most of the housework and the running of errands. Ah Ling did the marketing and cooking, giving us a pleasantly varied succession of Chinese and foreign dishes. Ah Po, the Ama, looked after Wilfred and attended to my personal wants. From the first I was fond of Ah Po, with her finely formed intelligent features, her soft voice and gentle unhurried manner she had served an american mistress before coming to me but showed a surprising willingness to adopt my particular way of doing things whether in making beds in keeping my clothes in order or in entertaining wilfred on the other hand ah ching elderly grave and full of responsibility was very partial to his accustomed way of arranging furniture and of washing windows and floors if left to himself he would dust odd nooks and corners faithfully but if i made any formal inspection of his labours he would invariably slight them to intimate that i should not be suspicious as a friend explained a form of logic that i found highly amusing a ling aside from his culinary ability was chiefly interesting because his eyes were really oblique as chinese eyes are supposed to be and usually are not and because his hair really curled as chinese hair is never supposed to do and does occasionally for a young pair bent on thrift we may have seemed very extravagant indeed in similar circumstances in america i should probably have thought it extravagant to have even one servant but this household was a very small one for china and on our modest income we maintained it with a satisfactory margin chan king was helpful and showed great tact and understanding in getting our establishment under way i would not confess to my utter bewilderment in trying to manage servants who did not understand half of what i said to them i think he became aware that i was holding on rather hard at times during those first months and he never failed me in turn i helped him revise his papers in the evenings and assisted him with his letters and he used to call me his secretary we discovered during that first year in china that we had formed a true partnership our social life was very pleasant we entertained a great deal in a simple way we belonged to a club or two 
and kept in close touch with the work of the returned students who have become an important factor in the national life though wishing to conserve what is best in the civilization of china they are bringing western ideas to bear upon the solution of political sociological and economic problems many of these students as well as other interesting people both chinese and foreign gathered at our house for dinners and teas there was a veteran of the customs service a portly gentleman with bristling white moustache who had been one of the first group of government students sent to america fifty years before he told interesting stories of the trials and joys of those early days and humorously lamented the fact that real apple pie was not to be obtained in china there was a distinguished editor of english publications a tall spare figure whose very quietness suggested reserves of mental power with him often was a short energetic man in early maturity a far-sighted educator and convincing orator i remember a lively discussion opened up by these two concerning the need for a chinese magazine devoted to the interests of the modern woman of china an early dream which is now being fulfilled there was a retired member of parliament with an unfailing zeal for political discussion who has since returned to the service of his government also a smiling young man who went about persuading old china of her need for progress but who could on occasion put aside his dignity to indulge a talent for diverting bits of comedy there was the chinese-american son of a former diplomat who born in america and coming to china as a grown man seemed definitely to recognize his kinship with the land of his fathers a fact that chan king and i found interesting for its possible bearing on the future of our own sons naturally most of our friends were the younger modern folk who were loosening the ancient bonds of formality in their daily lives but many of the older and more conservative people also used to come to our evening gatherings where my husband and i received side by side as i came to know the chinese i was delighted with their social deafness they stress grace of manner and courtesy as the foundations of all social life i was pleasantly impressed by the measure of deference that they showed to wives daughters sisters and friends so different from the contempt that western imagination supposes to be their invariable share occasionally i noticed a husband carefully translating that his wife might fully enjoy the conversation many of the women however spoke english excellently all our receptions and dinners were delightfully free and full of good talk the chinese have so beautifully the gift of saying profound things lightly they can think deeply without being heavy and pedantic i remember the first dinner party i attended in shanghai it was rather a grand affair with many guests all chinese save me and i'm almost chinese i said to my husband the men and women all sat together around one great table in excellent humor with each other and the talk was very gay a little chinese woman whom i knew rather well said to me later and think of it only last year in this house we should have been at separate tables when i asked her to explain she said that once men did not bring their guests to their homes at all then they brought them but entertained them in the men's side of the house later they admitted women to dine in the same room but at separate tables and now here we are chatting and dining together quite in western fashion i like this much better the little lady decided i was glad to see that all of them wore chinese dress for it is most impressively beautiful i wore my first jacket and plaited skirt that night a combination of pale green and black satin 
and now and then i would see chan king's eyes turned upon me with the look i best loved to see there a clear warm affection shining in them a certain steady glow of expression that had love and friendship and understanding in it i think the sight of me in the dress of his country confirmed in his mind my declaration that i loved china that i wanted to be a real chinese wife after this though for certain occasions the american fashion seemed more appropriate i wore chinese dress a great deal i remember a day when dr wu ting fang came to dinner and as he bowed to me obviously took note of my garb he looked at me very keenly for a moment as if he meant to ask a serious question then he said in his abrupt manner you are happy in that dress indeed i am i answered you like it better than you like american clothes he persisted i nodded firmly smiling and catching my husband's eye then wear it always said the doctor with a pontifical lifting of his fingers oddly enough my husband did not care for the native feminine fashion of trousers and never permitted me to wear them i considered them very graceful and comfortable but gladly adopted the severely plain skirts with the plates at the sides i had put on china to wear it always in my heart and mind and thought only of my husband his work and his people in the beginning i should have been perfectly content to remain cloistered to meet no one save a few woman friends to go nowhere life flowed by me so evenly that i was happy to drift with it filled with dreams the noises of hurrying half modernized shanghai reached me but vaguely where the floors were spread with white matting and the walls were hung with symbolic panels the click of the pony's feet on the pavement the thud of the rickshaw coolies heels as they drew their noiseless rubber-tired vehicles the strident scream of the automobile horns the strange long cries of the street vendors all came to me muffled as though through many curtains that sheltered me from the world but my husband insisted that i go about with him everywhere that he felt we should go that i help him entertain that i meet and mingle with many people both foreign and chinese he was always ready to advise me on social matters a more difficult undertaking than might be supposed i have already spoken of the many gradations in the meeting of east and west these alone are confusing enough and there are further complexities due to the fact that in the two civilizations the fine points of etiquette are often entirely at variance a single example will suffice the custom of serving a guest as soon as seated with some form of refreshment in the very conservative chinese household if the visitor even touches the cup of tea placed beside him on a small table he is guilty of a gross breach of good manners in the ultra-modern household he must drink the iced tea summer beverage or the piping hot winter drink to avoid giving offence then there are the variously modified establishments where he attempts an exact degree of compromise whether acknowledging the offering merely by a gracious bow or going further by raising it to the lips for a dainty sip or being still more liberal and consuming one half the proffered amount that such situations are often baffling even to young china i have heard it laughingly confessed in many lively discussions but though occasional errors are inevitable sincere goodwill is truly valued and seldom misunderstood chan king's ability to consider all points of view at once was very helpful to me but he forgot to warn me that in shanghai social calling is proper at any hour of the day from nine o'clock in the morning until ten o'clock at night i was therefore three days in learning 
during a short absence of his that early morning and late evening calling was an institution and not an accidental occurrence as i at first supposed finally ah ching gave me a hint i was in a negligee preparing for a morning of lazy play with wilfred and hoping there would be no interruptions when ah ching appeared and announced callers my face must have expressed surprise and a shade of annoyance as it had for three days previously at these summonses for ah ching hesitated a moment and then vouchsafed what he plainly considered a valuable piece of information in shanghai said ah ching he all time go to see all time come to see he paused all time he added firmly and departed i found this to be literally true and i therefore formed my habits of dress on the assumption that callers demanding the utmost formality of behaviour and appearance might be announced at any moment needless to say ah ching's he was pidgin english for she for my personal visitors were all women they were of many nationalities chinese of course and also american canadian english scotch and french with the chinese women especially i found myself in perfect harmony nowhere i believe does sincerity and good will meet with a warmer response they accepted me with a cordiality that was very real and rendered invaluable assistance in my initiation into the new life they took me calling shopping and marketing until shanghai ceased to be a bewildering maze of crowded thoroughfares they helped me to understand the complexities of chinese currency they explained the intricate points of fashion and dress and recommended skilful tailors from the first we were deeply interested in the meeting and blending of east and west that went on about us everywhere in every field of endeavour we found unique opportunity for fresh impressions in the second far eastern olympics held at shanghai that spring in the presence of many thousand spectators china the philippines and japan strove for supremacy in athletic prowess the affair was managed entirely by chinese and during most of the contests my husband was busy on the grounds in official capacity i sat in the grandstand with chinese woman friends some of whom were returned students and the rousing cheers the whole-hearted enthusiasm brought to us vivid memories of college days in america the evenings were filled with receptions and garden parties in honor of the visitors of course our pleasure in the whole affair was immeasurably heightened by china's well-earned triumph as the months passed chan king's high-hearted enthusiasm his dauntless will to carry through great work in the education of young china flagged to some degree from terrible disillusionment this is the problem all returned students have sooner or later to face and conquer they come home brimming with hope and filled with aspirations towards their country's betterment and gradually they are forced to acknowledge one enormous fact that china has been her glorious grim old self for too many centuries her feet are sunk too deeply in the earth of her ancient traditions to be uprooted by one generation of youth or two or three or a hundred chan king chafed and worried and worked too hard strangely enough he grew homesick for america though i did not america strides like a young boy and china creeps like an old woman he said bitterly one day after attending a meeting of the college board where his modern ideas of education had suffered a defeat at the hands of the reactionary body but china is a wise wise old woman i replied gently and very often during this time i would uphold the traditions of the east the ways of the western world my husband underwent disappointments 
irritations and trials that would have been unendurable in a less securely poised nature as it was he suffered so in the great things that he had little patience for the small ones and i often found him sudden of a temper with a quick asperity of tone and finality of judgment that showed me clearly how great a strain he was under but with us there was always love and chen king was very careful to make me understand even in the midst of small disappointments and vexations that these things were the universal human annoyances that had nothing to do with regrets or a sense of alienation i broke into tears one day when a sharp little scene occurred over nothing at all oh margaret my dearest he said taking me in his arms these moods mean nothing between us when we love each other so don't take them seriously what could destroy our happiness now in spite of the world-wide difference in our race and upbringing whatever difficulties of temperamental adaptation we had to meet were merely such as must be faced by any husband and wife in any land yet chang king's personal fascination for me his never-failing appeal to my imagination was definitely founded on the oriental quality in him i found throughout the years in every phase of our relation a constant irresistible always recurring thrill in the idea that we were not of the same race or civilization once when i confessed this fact to him he said do you love me only because i am chinese no i think i should have loved you no matter what race you came of but how can i know i like to feel that you love the essential me yes but the essential you is chinese he thought a moment chinese yes but a most respectable member of the dutch reformed church of america i won't let that injure you in my eyes i assured him laughing i was of the anglican faith and we often referred to the strange mixture of nationalities in our creeds my husband in spite of his firm faith was not of a deeply religious mind and of the two i was much more mystical in my beliefs love divine and human had come to mean everything to me in a literal and spiritual sense i believed obscurely at first but with increasing surety and faith as time went on that human love also was not of time only but of eternity as well and when i found that chan king did not share this belief i felt for the only time in all my marriage alien to him shut out by an impalpable veil from his profoundest inner life which i wished passionately to share in everything the discovery came hand in hand with our first shadow only the shadow of a shadow i might call it so vague at the beginning that we could not feel more than an uneasiness chan king fell ill though not seriously and he recovered quickly but on the upcurve of returning health he never quite regained the old plane of physical well-being signs oh the very smallest of signs warned us of a grave slow breaking down of his system under thisis we could not quite believe it his physician advised him to ease the strain of work as much as he could we talked together in the early hours of many nights chang king always insisting that his depression was the result of temporary fatigue sure to pass away within a few weeks repose in the open air of the hills it was during this time that i spoke to him of the everlastingness of love and my faith in a life farther on where could death take one of us that the other could not follow i asked him in strange triumph his eyes held mine a long minute his face was very sad i am not sure of that i have no idea of what we shall be to one another in another life 
i am only sure that we are all things to each other now an inexpressible sense of fear took hold of me chan king seemed at once terribly alien and removed i could not speak for i had the feeling of calling in a strange language across a great chasm i said nothing for fear of distressing him but he must have sensed my disquietude for he took my hands and held them to his face and let his eyes shine upon me don't look like that he said we have much time yet to think of eternity but from the day of this illness the shadow was never once removed from me now we were lured by the residential charms of the french concession with its broad tree-lined avenues and fresh wide-swept spaces so we took a new house in a terrace fronting on avenue joffrey we liked our large rooms each with its tiled fireplace its polished floors laid with chensing rugs its electric lights there was a grassy lawn with chinese orchids and a border of palms and magnolias and just around the corner from us was a public garden where to wilfred's delight dozens of children played each day under the care of their respective amas our staff of servants was now increased to five by the addition of a rickshaw coolie and a second amma chen king received shortly after this a letter from his father the first communication he had had from his family since our marriage it contained an invitation to return home for a visit since his mother wished very deeply to see him again i can interpret this in only one way margaret he said in a puzzled tone it is an offer of reconciliation that means that they do not know you are with me go and see for yourself what it is i told him for i would have consented for his sake to a reconciliation on almost any terms i had seen enough of chinese family life to understand the powerful bonds of affection and interest that bind the clan together and i felt in my own heart the cruelty of breaking those between mother and son and brother and brother i want to tell them about you chan king answered this is my opportunity before accepting their invitation chan king wrote and told them that his wife was with him and their replies to this proved him right in his first surmise his family knew he had returned to china and having heard nothing further of his marriage had supposed that it was all over this was not exactly a surprising conclusion for them to reach more than one foreign woman has refused to accompany her chinese husband home i myself came in contact with an occasional half-household in which a chinese was held in china by his business affairs while his wife waited for him on the other side of the world sometimes too she did not wait and the marriage ended in the conventional way that is in the divorce court chan king's people imagined that something of the sort had occurred to him and were quite ready to wipe out old scores and resume the ties of relationship after having written the initial letter of reconciliation they held to their attitude in a thoroughbred way only amending their welcome a trifle by requesting him to visit them alone very tactfully and gently they put it like this his father was growing old and any sudden change disturbed him the household had lately been added to by marriage and births and he would find everything very much more comfortable if he should come alone he went firmly resolved to change the mind of his family toward me and i too was anxious for them to know that a foreign marriage had not harmed chen king during the six weeks of his absence his letters were cheerfully non-committal though he spoke of his happiness in being in his mother's house again i thought a great deal about that house the intricate lives of the people in it 
and their many degrees of kinship and authority chan king had told me enough to give me a fairly clear picture of them i had always admired their ability to sustain difficult relations under the same roof with the utmost good temper and mutual courtesy yet i was western enough to feel that chan king and i knew each other better and had been more free to learn each other thoroughly alone in our own household which was growing in quite a chinese fashion i expected my second child and looked forward with much hope to the new life for i had always been deeply maternal and wanted several children but to chang king and me our love for each other was the greatly important thing in life the reason for all the rest of our existence we accepted the fact of birth as naturally as we did the change of seasons children were essential to our happiness but not the dominant essential we ordered our home for ourselves as two lovers who had elected to pass their life together chan king expressed our views thus the chinese ideal is that the family is the end the children the means of keeping it up in the west the children are the end and the home merely the means of keeping them up you and i have it perfectly adjusted i think the home is for all of us and all of us have proper places in it chan king returned early one morning and i knew from my first glimpse of his face that his visit had been a fruitful one i flew to his arms and as he kissed me i saw that his eyes were serene and contented how is your august mother my lord i asked him with a bow my mother is in good health and wishes to meet her daughter-in-law he answered and in spite of the bantering tone i knew he was in earnest i wanted to know how this change of feeling had come about when i told them of you said chang king my mother was visibly amazed i did not understand she kept repeating i did not understand and before i left she said to me if she is all you tell me she is why do you not bring her here i didn't mention the fact that this was our first invitation margaret should you like to go my dearest i hesitated a moment yes but not yet i answered we will not go for a while chan king assured me we talked a great deal about my husband's visit and i gained new light on the actual facts of his estrangement from his family and the enormous significance that his marriage assumed in the minds of his chinese relatives i can hardly exaggerate the importance of the position held by the eldest son in the higher class chinese household after his father he is the male head of the family his wife is the attendant shadow the never-failing companion of his mother our phrase a man marries is expressed in chinese as he leads in a new woman under the old regime he literally did so for he invariably brought his bride to his ancestral home the phrase for the marriage of a girl is she goes forth from the family a new woman is the term for a bride the western education of many young men of the chinese upper class has resulted in some acute readjustment in the ancestral households often these elder sons return marry according to the old custom and live in their parental homes but often too they marry advanced chinese women set up establishments and professions of their own far from their native cities and live after semi-foreign ways in this respect our case was somewhat typical as i have already related chang king's mother had been looking forward for years to the marriage of her eldest son with the little miss li ying she had expected in her middle age the usual release of the chinese woman from the bonds of youth having been a faithful and obedient wife and daughter-in-law she rightfully expected to assume authority over her family 
leaning on the arm of her son's wife. This younger woman would take her place in the long chain of dutiful daughters. She would help to welcome guests, she would keep up the family shrines, she would perform all manner of household duties under the supervision of her mother-in-law. On the death of her husband's mother, she would become the woman head of the family, responsible for everything, her privileges and authority growing with her years, especially if she were the mother of sons. Her great mission would be to furnish children to the clan, in order that the ancestral shrines might never be without worshippers. I explain these matters at this point in order that I may not be mistaken for a moment when I tell the incident that follows. By this time I had lived long enough in China to be almost thoroughly orientalized, in so far as my sympathies were concerned, at least, and yet when Chang King, after talking for a while about the events of his visit home, came to a full pause and said uncertainly, "'There is one thing I wish to tell you, but I am not sure you will understand.' I was a trifle apprehensive, but I answered at once, "'Of course I shall understand. China has been kind to me. What have I to fear?' Chan King then went on deliberately. "'Not until I saw my mother again did I understand that I had done a really cruel thing to her in depriving her of a daughter-in-law on whom she could lean on in her old age.' Oh, Margaret, woman's lot is not easy, with all the complexities of parents and brothers and children, and I would have atoned for my share in all this, if I could, but of course there was nothing I could do, nothing at all. And very calmly he told me that shortly after his arrival at home, his mother had conferred with him seriously on her need of a daughter-in-law. In accordance with ancient customs, she wished him to take a Chinese secondary wife, who would live in the family home, who would be, in a fashion, proxy for me in the role of daughter-in-law. Chan King's mother offered to arrange this marriage for him, and assured him that the secondary wife and her children would be well cared for, and treated kindly during his long absences. I listened incredulously, and the question I could not ask was in my eyes. I knew, of course, that the custom of taking secondary wives was not unusual among wealthy families in China, even where both wives lived under the same roof. But I had given it only the most casual thought, and not once had it occurred to me that the problem would touch my life." Brought suddenly level with it, I suffered a shock at the very foundation of my nature. I could not think, of course, in the moment that followed my husband's recital. I only felt a great roaring tide of pain rising about me, a sense of complete helplessness such as I have never known before or since. I wonder now at my instant subjective readiness to believe that my husband had conformed to this custom of his country, that he had shaken off his western training at his first renewed contact with the traditional habits of his race. "'Did you?' I asked finally, and stopped. He came to me instantly, his arms about me. When he saw the distress in my face, he frowned, with an odd, remorseful twist of the brows. I wonder that you ask, he said, how could I come back to you, and to your loyalty and trust, with the shadow of that deception between us? I made it very clear to my mother that I would never have any wife but you. It's you and I together, dear one, and no one else, so long as we both shall live. And his words had the solemn sound of a vow renewed. This high honesty of Chang King's with me was a rock on which I founded my faith, and his final repudiation of an accepted form among his people represented a genuine sacrifice on his part, so far as his material welfare was concerned. 
as generously and unhesitatingly as he had made the first one at our marriage he laid the second votive offering on the altar of our love he had you see according to the view of his father and mother hopelessly injured them in his marriage above all he had denied in himself the great racial instinct of the chinese to obey his parents if he wished to please them here was his last opportunity the taking of a chinese secondary wife would have been a complete atonement in their eyes at the same time it would have meant his instant restoration to his rightful place among them first in their affections and inheritance the family assistance would have placed him at once in the position toward which without it he would probably have to struggle for years and later i understood how very easily he might have complied without my needing ever to know of the fact indeed i could have lived in his mother's house with a second wife and never have suspected that she was there in that position so securely welded and impassive is the clan sense the reserve and remoteness of the personal relation when the family peace and dignity are to be considered some of these matters i had been aware of since my life in china began some of them i learned that day in talking with chan king and others as i have said i discovered gradually afterward but from that day certainly our relations subtly shifted and settled and crystallized we both became forever certain that we could not fail each other in any smallest thing into my heart came a warmth of repose like a steadily burning lamp we were assured of our love beyond any possibility of doubt ever again and for a time we experienced a renaissance of youthful happiness a fine fervor of renewed hopes and ambitions as though spring had come again miraculously when we had expected october the family letters came now regularly to chen king with always a kindly message for me evidently relations were to be resumed on the plane of a good friendship nothing more but that was so much more than we had dared to hope for that we were perfectly happy to have it so chen king must have mentioned his slowly failing health for his mother sent a worried letter to him and asked him to come home for a while once more chen king decided that his affairs would not warrant his absence and wrote her to that effect one morning as i sat on the sun porch sewing ah ching appeared suddenly before me master's mother he downstairs he announced calmly i gazed at him without understanding what do you say ah ching came nearer he held up one hand and counted his words off on his fingers slowly miss c sabi master have got one mother he inquired patiently yes yes well he just now have come he downstairs i got to my feet i was more frightened and nervous than i had ever been i remembered to be grateful i was wearing complete chinese dress a black skirt and blue velvet jacket this fact assumed an amusing importance in my mind as i stood there struggling to get myself in hand i had planned this meeting a thousand times and now that it was fairly upon me i was totally without resource i progressed downstairs confusedly running a few swift steps and then stopping short and beginning again slowly if chen king had been there i should have fled to him and left the entire situation in his hands but i was alone and certain of one thing only i meant to win the love of my chinese mother if i could subjectively all the tales i have heard of chinese mothers-in-law must have impressed me more than i had admitted for i remembered something chen king had told me long before i cannot describe to you the importance of the mother in the chinese household 
she is the complete autocrat with almost final authority over her sons daughters-in-law servants relatives everybody except her husband who is usually absent on his business her old age is a complete reversal of the restraint and discipline of her youth i stopped short at the door of the drawing-room i saw my husband's mother for the first time she had become to me a personality of almost legendary grandeur and i felt a little wave of surprise going over to me that she looked somehow so real and alive and genuine she sat in a big tall-backed chair her hands spread flat on her knees her face was the face of the young mother in the photograph chan king had shown me only grown older and a trifle more severe she was dressed in black brocade its stiff folds and precise creases accentuating her dignity under the edges of her skirt glimmered her tiny gray shoes embroidered in red and green at her side stood the male relative who had accompanied her a chinese gentleman of the old school in a long gown of dark silk behind her stood a maid and two men servants i knew that she spoke no english and as yet i had no knowledge of her southern dialect there was a sharp pause in the dead silent room while we regarded each other end of chapter two of my chinese marriage by may fran king this librivox recording is in the public domain first daughter-in-law i clasped my hands in the chinese way smiled and bowed my chinese mother rose at once and took a step toward me balancing on her tiny feet with the aid of a thick gold-headed cane i saw that she was unusually tall then surprisingly she extended her hand american fashion and i shook it the eyes of each of us still searching the other's face i saw in hers the look i needed for reassurance the mingled kindness and apprehension a trace of the anxiety that i am sure was the very counterpart of my own expression i knew that i knew then that her heart was no more certain than mine was and that this meeting was as important to her as it was to me ah ching brought forward my chair and we sat down together smiling at each other letting our gestures speak for us finally she stretched forth her right hand palm down measuring the height of a small child from the floor inclining her head toward me her eyebrows up in a question i made a pillow of my two hands laid my head upon it eyes closed and then pointed up we were both delighted at this simple pantomime the elderly man her cousin looked pleased in sympathy and even the three solemn servants smiled a little she asked me in gestures where my husband was i waved widely and comprehensively toward the street in the general direction of the city she nodded settling back a trifle drawing a long breath we had reached the end of our power to converse without the aid of an interpreter when i heard chang king's ring at the gate i hurried out to meet him with the news he was even more excited than i was and hastened ahead of me to the house i walked very slowly in order that they might have their first greeting undisturbed and when i arrived they were beaming upon each other and talking the south province dialect over a very sleepy and cherubic infant whom chan king with paternal pride had ordered down to greet his grandmother at once the retinue settled chan king informed me that our mother would remain with us for six weeks during this time i learned the art of pantomime beyond anything i had ever hoped for in one of my undemonstrative nature 
my chinese mother and i conversed with eyebrows hands smiles noddings and shakings of head much turning of eyes i had an instant affection and admiration for her and she adopted toward me a gently confidential attitude that pleased me very much she had brought presents for us in the chinese way for me a delicately wrought chain of chinese gold in a box of carved sandalwood for wilfred a dozen suits of chinese clothes in the bright patterns worn by children of the orient and so becoming to the proud wee man that arrayed in them he seemed already to be coming into his heritage she also brought great hampers of fresh fruits pomelos lychees and dragon's eyes and countless jars of preserved fish and meats and vegetables which had been chan king's favorites when he was a boy at home madame liang had the chinese woman's love for shopping accompanied by her cousin and the servants we went from silk merchant to porcelain dealer and from brass worker to rug weaver gathering treasures though she carried on most of her negotiations through her cousin she bargained with a firmness and a sense of values that i admired very much in the silk shops she bought marvellous braided satins and embroidered silks and she had me select the pattern i wanted for myself though she preserved most carefully the distinctive features of the dress of her own province she was much interested in shanghai styles and examined my wardrobe critically noting the short sleeves with tight-fitting undersleeves and the skirts with seven plates not five as in canton for example at each side notwithstanding the popular western fancy that fashions never change in china the chinese woman is painstakingly particular as to the exact length and fullness or scantiness of her coats skirts and trousers she is carefully precise about the width of bias bands or braid or lace that she uses for trimming the number and arrangement of fastenings the shape and height of her collar all of these details vary as tyrannically from season to season under shanghai guidance as certain style features do with us under the leadership of new york or paris moreover as against our four seasons the fashion devotee of china takes account of eight each with its appropriate style and weight of clothing at home mother sewed a great deal using her hands gracefully and very competently in spite of the long curved fingernails on her left hand my american sewing machine fascinated her she had an excellent hand-powered machine at home chan king explained but mine worked with a treadle and she wished to try it i took the tiny brightly shod feet in my hands and set one forward and one backward on the iron trellis and she moved them very well alternately and ran several seams with energy chan king his mother and i went to chinese cafes together and madame liang was pleased and amused to see that i not only used chopsticks with these but had a real taste for chinese food we used to treat ourselves to all sorts of epicurean dishes spiced chicken and duck shark's fins bird's nest soup with pigeon eggs my favorite delicacy seaweed and bamboo shoots candied persimmons lotus seeds and millet pudding with almond tea once in a roof garden cafe where i was wearing american clothes my use of chopsticks aroused considerable interest among neighboring groups of diners and stray comments reached us for the chinese are always pleased to see foreigners familiar with their customs no doubt she is a missionary lady a young woman remarked in my husband's native dialect hearing and understanding mother immediately said in clear gracious tones my son perhaps your wife would like to have some american food now 
chan king translated for me both comment and suggestion and i felt pleased to learn that at any rate my chinese mother was not ashamed in a public place to acknowledge her american daughter mother was fond of the drama and since shanghai had some excellent theatres we made up several parties during her stay the great semicircular stage on which the famous old historical play that we saw was acted was hung with gorgeous embroideries laid with a thick paking rug of immense size and brilliantly lighted by electricity as was the entire theatre the actors wore the magnificent official and military robes of an early dynasty as on the elizabethan stage women's parts were taken by men who achieved by cleverly constructed shoes the effect of bound feet i found the deafening drums and gongs a little trying at moments and the crude property makeshifts somewhat incongruous with the wonderfully elaborate hangings and costumes but being familiar with the story i understood the action and so evidently enjoyed it that mother was surprised anew as chan king afterward told me we sat in our balcony box above the vague tiers of lower seats packed with the restless audience of men women and many children in the arms of their amahs on the wide front rail of our box was the inevitable pot of tea with room also for such fruits sugar-cane melon seeds and meat and rice dishes as we wished to purchase from the endless variety offered by eager boys in round caps and blue cotton gowns now and then an attendant came with a huge tea-kettle to refill our teapot and once he offered us the usual steaming hot towels for sticky fingers chan king waved these away energetically awful custom he said to me unhygienic how can they do it and he added something of the kind to his mother in chinese she regarded him with comprehension a tiny gleam of superior wisdom in her eyes but she made no reply she had taken a fancy to wilfred who by this time had a fair vocabulary of chinese which he always used in talking to his amma he was a handsome child typically chinese very charming in his manner very fond of his amma and his indulgent grandmother madame liang would take his chin in her hands and steady his features intently nodding her head with approval then she would stroke his round black poll and give him melon seeds or almonds from her pocket wilfred used a weird mixture of dialects a confusion of mandarin and the shanghai vernacular with a dash of cantonese from his amma madame liang set out patiently to teach him her own dialect as well when her visit was ended our mother said to chan king this is a chinese house with a chinese wife in it everything is chinese i could never have believed it without seeing for i thought your wife was a western woman i am happy and she told him again that we must come and visit with her for she needed us chan king's father a member of an old established firm in the import and export trade in the philippines was away looking after his business or exchanging visits with friends of his own age and rank his homecomings were in the nature of a vacation the management of the household depended on madame liang as she talked i realized by her face by chan king's answers by all that i knew of chinese family life that we were a part of that clan and should be so always a hint of the solidarity i now feel with my husband's family came to me we were not separate from them nor should we be after our mother was gone chan king said something of this sort to me quoting what she had said about my not being western but i love you to be western in this sense he told me 
that you and i have companionship and freedom and equality in our love that is what makes me happiest before chen king and i closed the house in shanghai to depart for the southern hills our second son alfred was born an american woman asked me when he was about six weeks old if i did not feel a sense of alienation at the sight of the wee oriental face at my breast quite simply and truthfully i answered no my husband was not in any way alien to me how then could our child be so his coming provided me with a welcome excuse to remain at home quietly for a short while i now attempted to learn at the same time both mandarin and the dialect of chan king's province a method of study that hampered me constantly at first but my husband was an encouraging teacher and i began uncertainly to use my new knowledge trying it mostly on my young son wilfred who was the real linguist of the family he took my chinese very seriously i cannot say so much for chan king who was greatly amused at my inflection toward the close of the year i decided to take a place as teacher of english and history in a chinese girls high school chan king was surprised when i told him that i wished to teach but he offered no objection and watched with interest my progress through the year i loved my teaching still more i loved the girls in my classes collectively and individually i found them supremely worth while in spirit and mind i cannot say how lovely the young womanhood of china seemed to me i began to yearn for a daughter and when toward the close of the second term i found that i might perhaps have my heart's desire i realized that my husband shared it in the early fall our mother wrote and asked us to come south for the cold season she also expressed the hope that the coming grandchild might be born in her own province chan king had been encouragingly strong for over a year but he had always found the northern winters hard we decided that the time had come to fulfil our promise of visiting the ancestral home chan king secured six months leave of absence within ten days we had closed our affairs temporarily dismissed the servants with the exception of the ama and the faithful ah ching got our boxes together and bidden our friends farewell the leaves were falling on the avenue the plants were shrivelled at the edges on the sun porch the winds blew ominously shrill under the eaves chen king grew pale and began to cough again out of the teeth of the terrible shanghai winter we fled into the hospitable softness of the south by a large steamship we started out on what was ordinarily a brief journey but by those wartime schedules changes and delays were the invariable rule after three unforeseen changes and as many delays we reached a port just over the line in my husband's province there we stopped intending to go on three days later by the little battered tramp steamer that puffed noisily at the dock putting off dried fruits and dyes, taking on rice and cloth and sandalwood. But we did not go on, as it happened. Instead, a tiny, smiling, competent woman physician, wearing the southern costume and possessed of a curious fund of practical wisdom in medical matters, attended me in her native hospital at the birth of our daughter Alicia on a vaguely gray gently stimulating winter morning ten days later our bouncing little ship for i had cajoled chan king into allowing me to travel stood to out from port and sampans came to meet us like giant fish bobbing and dipping and swaying upon the waves 
these sampans with their great eyes painted on each side of the prow and their curious upcurved sterns came toward us in a gala fleet rowed by lean over-muscled men in faded blue cotton garments i was very gay and much exhilarated by the soft sunshine that broke through the mist as i climbed down with chan king's help into one of these boats the harbour was busy with small craft flat-bottomed gigs or baggage boats besides the junks whose square brown sails swung creaking in the wind two chinese men-of-war rose over us their vast bulky sides painted battleship grey out and beyond an island not more than a mile long turned its irregular profile towards us a long mass of huge grey boulders jutting abruptly from a sparkling sea as we were being rowed into the mainland we were near enough to the island to see quite plainly the tile-roofed houses surrounded by arched verandas repeated again and again in long undulating lines that gave a pleasantly lacy effect the island was shaded with trees and winter foliage not the brilliant green of summer but the sage green and pale tan of november through this intermittent curtain the walls of the houses shone in dull blue and coral pink and clear grey jagged cacti shot up among the bulbous rocks and everywhere the scarlet poinsettia set the hills aglow with patches of brilliant colour i loved this island instantly i said to chang king this is our island of the blessed where we shall live when we are old at the jetty ah ching went up to hail sedan chair bearers and soon i was borne rapidly along a few yards ahead of my husband's chair i was filled with a delicious elation at being in chan king's province so near to the very village that he knew as a little boy with enormous curiosity i peeped through the curtain flaps which were transparent from within we were passing through the town that lay along the water's edge a bright open little place where the small houses with curved tiled roofs hugged the ground we went through the crooked streets which were really nothing more than broad paths at a steady pace we left the ragged edges of the town and began to ascend the hills i raised my curtains a trifle and ventured to look out freely emotion surged up in me i wished to cry for joy in this homecoming for it was our real homecoming together and i felt a secret share in all the life my husband had known here up in the narrow twisting path we wound toward the hills which were covered with a smoky amber mist scattered closely along the upward road apart from the dwellings were small terraces enclosing plots of cultivated ground filled with growing things wherever the folk could find a lush flat place on the stony hills robbed by deforestation of all but grass they had planted their vegetables these little patches of colour coaxed by thrifty gardeners out of the soil washed into the hill pockets added a festive humorous note to the winter landscape otherwise so brown and sere i thought frivolously of a solemn giant wearing his party nosegays the hills billowed away immensely until they were silhouettes against the dull orange and ashy purple of the morning sun struggling through the clouds solid steeply curved narrow bridges of stone made us a path over the frequent streams that rushed toward the valley here we came full upon the ancestral village of my husband's family it lay compact and many-roofed upon the side of a hill as intricately woven and inevitably looking as a colony of birds nests as naturally a part of the earth as though it had sprung from planted seeds rows of walls ran along the main thoroughfare there were a few people astir yet 
and the doors were closed in all the low-eaved plaster and stone houses our chairs were set down before a tall hooded gate in a wall of stone grey aching knocked the gates were opened and the servants came hurrying out accompanied by three leaping black chow dogs which barked in frantic challenge till chang king spoke to them and changed their menace into joyous welcome we entered a spacious courtyard and crossed an exquisite garden one of the most beautiful i saw in china an artificial lake rippled placidly disturbed only by the darting goldfish laurel and magnolia trees darkened the paths a thicket of bamboo wavered and cast its reflection in the water at the edge of the lake chan king helped me from the chair and together we passed into the main hall through the wide flung doors madame liang early apprised of our arrival was standing there and my first sight of her gave me a renewed sense of homecoming i was dimly aware of a large hall at the back of which stood a high altar with wreaths of sweet-smelling smoke rising in straight columns before lettered tablets and brilliant images under glass cases the glitter of golden and scarlet embroideries against the wall splintered the dimness with rays of light like sunshine through a prism heavily carved black wood chairs with tea-tables and also marble-topped stools with gay brocaded cushions were ranged about the room we passed through this main hall into the apartment of madame liang where i was given a chair and i sat suddenly remembering that i was very tired other members of the family distant relatives and first cousins and guests all women came in and i was presented to them madame springtime wife of the second son did first honors for the family she was so very youthful only seventeen and so wistfully otherworldly that among those mature housewives clever and practical managers of their households and husbands estates she seemed like a branch of peach bloom in festal garb of jade green and lavender embroidered shoes on her tiny feet and an embroidered headdress crowning her shining black hair and framing the oval of her shy smiling face with its slow black eyes she came bearing a lacquered tray and presenting to each of us sweet tea in cups of finest porcelain with standards and covers of silver and with tiny silver spoons having flower-shaped bowls the pretty little tea ceremony was then repeated by various members of the family while the small sons were given hot milk and cakes an eager group gathered about the tiny new daughter still sleeping peacefully a bubbling busy little lady about the age of madame liang leaned over me with a quizzical smile and bobbed her gay pretty head emphatically at me when my mother introduced her as madame chow elaborately dressed in rich colors in direct contrast to my soberly garbed mother she was as merry as madame liang was grave and she tripped about on her almost invisible golden lily feet with an energy that did not destroy the grace of her willow walk but the many-colored costumes the great curtained bed on one side the voices all suddenly seemed far away and as i wavered smiling determinedly i heard my husband's voice mother thinks you are tired so this woman will show you our room where you must lie down and rest some time later as i lay resting with alicia sleeping on my arm on the bed which had purple curtains and soft white blankets chan king stepped quietly into the room feel as comfortable as you look he asked and when i nodded drowsily he touched a box of cakes 
these were brought to you by madame chow the busy little lady out there you know he hesitated a moment she would have been my mother-in-law if i hadn't insisted on your mother instead and he gave my cheek a gentle pinch i was now wide awake the little bird lady out there mother of li ying i asked where is li ying then they didn't tell me anything directly chan king answered but i gather from several pointed conversations carried on in my hearing that madame chow has just returned from her daughter's house in singapore just imagine little li ying is married too and also has three children two girls and a boy i think said my chinese husband with a charming complacence putting a hand over mine and stooping to kiss alicia's pink sleeping face i think our arrangement is much better sons should be older then daughters are properly appreciated at noon after an hour's quiet sleep i was again aroused by chang king who stood beside a maid-servant with a tray i sat up i expected to be out for luncheon i said preparing to rise chan king looked perturbed stay where you are he warned my mother has just been scolding me for allowing you to travel with a ten days old baby as if i could do anything about it i told her blaming it all on eve in the most approved christian fashion she admires your spirit but thinks that for your health's sake you should rest two weeks longer at least i lay down meekly very well i said obedience is my watchword and for the prescribed time i lay in my pretty room all my senses deeply responsive to the life going on in a chinese household the clang of small gongs that summoned the servants much laughter coming in faintly or clearly as my doors were opened or shut the tap of lily feet along the passageway the glimmer of madame springtime's radiant pink or blue robes as she entered to inquire after my welfare or bring some new delicacy that had been procured for me the smoke of incense from the altar floating into the room at intervals with a pungent sweetness that roused vague memories and emotions everything in the house hangings clothes furnishings was saturated with this aroma mingled with a bitter smell which is distilled by immense age and touched with the irritative quality of dust this odor now means china to me and it is more precious than all other perfumes in the world but chan king life is nothing but food i protested about the third day when my fourth meal had been served to me early in the afternoon but the quantities are small he answered much better way don't you think than taking great meals many hours apart early in the morning the young maid assigned to me would bring in a bowl of hot milk and biscuit in our apartment at half past eight she would serve breakfast consisting of soft boiled rice congee with various kinds of salty sweet and sour preparations at eleven o'clock there was turtle soup or chicken broth at noon came tiffin which consisted of substantial meat and vegetable dishes fish and soup and dry boiled rice our mid-afternoon refreshment was noodles of wheat or bean flour or perhaps a variety of fancy cakes tea kept hot by a basket cosy was always on hand in every room at seven the family dined and after the two weeks were up i joined them sitting at the first table with mother and my husband dinner was an elaborate meal in courses with rice at the close at bedtime came hot milk again or sweet congee or perhaps tea brewed from lotus seed or almonds i was continually nibbling 
i thought chinese food delicious particularly in my husband's province noted for its delicious crunchy fried things but chan king had yearnings for american dishes i gave the head cook minute instructions for preparing fricasseed chicken fresh salads beefsteak with spanish sauce even american hot cakes and he enjoyed the american canned goods with butter cheese jams and bread which were brought in frequently from the port an episode that caused much merriment was chan king's initiation of his family into the mystery and history of chop suey the rich joke of that made in america chinese dish is penetrating to every household where the returned student is found in shanghai we had heard with amusement how the bewildered chef of the y m c a cafe had gone down to one of the great trans-pacific liners lying in port to learn from the head cook on board just what this chop suey which all his returned student patrons were demanding might be now with memories of old college club activities prompting us and with a skilful cook to carry out our directions chan king and i introduced into the ancestral home that most misunderstood dish in all the world the family agreed that though vaguely familiar it was unlike anything they had ever tried before and they decided without dissenting vote that it was superior to fricasseed chicken spanish steak or hot cakes at this time my husband's brother lin king came home for a brief stay i decided from photographs that he resembled his father who was still away lin king and madame springtime seemed well suited to each other and happy although the marriage had been arranged by their families and they had never seen each other before the ceremony i decided that the old custom had much merit after all for other people and said so to my husband adding when our children are grown we must have them all marry chinese chan king looked at me long in silence and then sighing humorously he asked what of their father's example my dear since my chinese was still bookish and unpractised in the all-important matters of tone and local idiom i could not converse with the family and at the dinner-table and in my mother's apartment i was as silent and meek and pleasant of manner as madame springtime herself madame springtime served formal tea to our many guests in absolute silence with a sweet fixed smile in the corners of her red mouth i watched her with consuming interest for she was acting as first daughter-in-law in my stead the machinery of life ran with smoothness of long habit and complete discipline the meals were served the apartments kept in exquisite order and the children cared for by a corps of servants trained in minutia by an exacting mistress who knew precisely what she wanted our days were left free for the practice of small courtesies the exchange of pretty attentions and the care of the ancestral altar from the ceremonies that took place before this altar at various times my husband kept himself his wife and children sedulously aloof it was neither asked nor expected that he would do otherwise just as our attendance at the little mission church was accepted without question at other times however i had ample opportunity to study the altar and enjoy the beauty of its massive carvings its elaborate incense burners and candlesticks its exquisitely wrought embroideries a porcelain image of the buddhistic goddess of mercy in her character of sun giver set within a large glass case fascinated me by its remarkable resemblance to certain catholic images but the ancestral tablets interested me more 
and the respect that i have always accorded objects sacred to others was in this instance mingled with profoundly personal feelings the interblended characteristics of those men and women so many years dead and gone lived on in the man who was my husband their life currents pulsed warmly in the veins of my children perhaps some deep insight gained beyond the grave enabled them to know how truly i acknowledged my debt to them how earnestly i hoped those children might not prove unworthy of their heritage with the help of chan king's coaching and my personal observations i soon learned the gracious routine of the house at ten o'clock every morning i presented myself at the door of madame liang's apartment and sat with her for several hours often over tiffin even till tea-time if she signified a desire for my company if the weather was fair we would walk in the garden she leaning lightly on my arm her cane tapping on the flagstones at times also tea was served here with the small children joining us for hot milk and sweet cakes i was several days in getting the members of the household identified in their proper relations for there were thirty persons gathered in that big low-roofed rambling compound behind the high enveloping wall they were nearly all women and two-thirds of them were servants the quiet soft-mannered woman relatives spent nearly all of their time in their own apartments madame liang's powerful personality silent and compelling paled the colors of nearly all the temperaments around her her friend madame chow was immensely comforting to her for she could not be persuaded to take anything very seriously madame liang laughed with her more than with any one else while they busily embroidered they gossiped and i listened to their musical speech with its soft southern accents and chiming many-toned cadences i used to think as i sat in a deep cushioned chair nursing the small alicia with a pot of tea at my elbow that madame liang in her gorgeous heavily carved black and orange bed enclosed on three sides by panels of painted silk and draped over the front with silk curtains held back by tasselled brocaded bands was a link in the chain of everlasting things she had come into the house exactly as new women had done century after century and she had lived out her life unquestioningly according to their precepts and example there was a monumental timeless dignity about her as she sewed and talked of simple matters in her presence i felt young and facile and terribly unanchored i talked these things over with chang king in the dark of the night when all the household was silent he was interested in my reactions knowing that they were the outcome of a profound personal love for his family and sympathy with everybody in it spiritually chang king also was in sympathy with his family practically well as i have said there were moments when he longed for american food and his first deed in the house was to order the bed curtains removed from our apartments they were removed and nothing was said a wonderful spirit of courtesy and toleration prevailed in the family life with a complete absence of that criss-cross of personal criticism that our western freedom of speech permits not that there were not undercurrents intimate antagonisms here and there personal sacrifices and sorrows but they were not recognized for in chinese life individual claims are eternally relinquished in the interest of clan peace and well-being there was one authority and it was vested in madame liang 
such a system makes for harmony and preserves the institution of the family on which all china is founded making no conscious effort i myself yet became so imbued with this spirit that when the government summons came for chan king to report in peking early in the new year i choked down my anguish and said how splendid for us all chan king when are you going we were in the last week of the old year and at madame liang's earnest entreaty my husband delayed his departure as the summons permitted that in the midst of his family he might celebrate the most delightful of all holidays delicious cooking odors now drifted about everywhere new clothes for every one were made ready and faces took on a shining happiness one evening after a visit with his mother chan king came to me laughing heartily mother reminds me he said that for three days it is customary for the maids when sweeping the floor to pile the dust carefully in the corner instead of throwing it out lest the family good fortune should be thrown out with it but she says of course it is only an old superstition and if you like you may tell the maid to remove the sweepings as usual i laughed too then i said tell mother we shall do our part toward keeping good fortune in the family for three days also continued chang king no harsh or scolding word is to be spoken by any one and therefore he went on sonorously your tyrannical chinese husband will cease to lecture his american wife who is certain to need it though i looked into his eyes bright with irrepressible gaiety and suddenly i kissed them shut my own eyes misty oh my dearest i whispered you are just a little boy at home again in spite of the silver threads and i smoothed the black locks already sprinkled with grey chan i love the chinese new year i said even now i see it all again my husband was wearing a long dignified gown of dark green satin unfigured as is customary for officials dark green trousers short brown jacket lined with soft fur black satin cap and black boots wilfred was quite a young gentleman in long gown of blue-green silk braid trimmed jacket of dark green blue trousers and red tufted cap chubby alfred was dressed in lavender jacket scarlet trousers a tiger face apron of red white and black embroidered slippers and a gay little knitted cap alicia whom the whole family loved best in her frilled white american dresses added now a pink silk jacket and an adorable little pink and black cap which gave an oriental grace to her features i wore my latest shanghai creation in pale lilac and black figured satin guests came and went incessantly and we made our calls in the village the air was filled with odors of spice molasses roasted meats seed cakes and millet candy and with sounds of firecrackers gongs and happy voices but it was over at last the time for my husband's departure had come with silent expertness ah ching set about packing in three days chan king was ready to go he was coaching me in the household phrases i should need most in making myself understood without his help madame liang decided that during my husband's absence i should assume my position as first daughter-in-law i had no apprehension in regard to the minute exacting duties that would devolve upon me as a right-hand companion to my husband's mother for i loved her but i was not sure of my tact or my deftness and i felt strung up painfully at the thought of my immediate future 
after the hourly companionship of months parting from chen king was very terrible indeed he was in and out of our apartment moving about the house with restless energy arranging final details at last he came and stood beside me tell me good-bye now dearest he whispered afterward out there we shall have no opportunity he drew me close and we kissed with deep feeling the tears in my eyes refusing to be suppressed any longer don't cry he begged with unaccustomed emotion don't cry or i can't leave you then he held my face up and dried my tears with his handkerchief and said solemnly smile at me and i smiled we went across to his mother's apartment and she came out the tears on her cheeks not stanched joined by the rest of the family we accompanied him to the entrance and then to the gate which stood open almost blocked by the waiting sedan chair chan king was in chinese dress and as he stood there profiled toward me among the group of servants giving his final directions he seemed more oriental more absorbed into his country than i remembered ever to have seen him he made a profound bow to his mother with formal words of leave-taking and gave me a grave little nod then without looking back he stepped into the chair the curtains were drawn and the coolies trotted off down the steep path followed a little way by the bounding black dogs mother and i stood together after the others had gone and watched his chair jostling down the narrow paved way then we turned and looked at each other rueful smiles on our mouths tears in our eyes we shook our heads at each other i half raised a hand to my heart and then let it fall i think both of us found our lack of mutual language a welcome excuse for silence madame liang turned toward the house the gates closed behind us i gave her my arm in support until we reached the doorway then i stepped a pace behind her as she entered without speaking i waited until she had knelt at the altar and the incense was rising in clouds before the imperturbable images under their glass cases then i attended her to her own apartment my life as a real chinese daughter-in-law had begun end of chapter three of my chinese marriage by may fran king this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the eternal hills as i followed my chinese mother into her apartments i thought of the benevolent croakings of friends their words rattled through my memory like pebbles shaken in a pail she can never be happy with a chinese husband later it was it is all very well in america but wait until she goes to china when i had happily established myself there heaven help her said they if she tries to live with her chinese mother-in-law in shanghai foreign friends had predicted oh yes she's lovely in your house but wait until you try living till you try living in her house this is the last ditch margaret i said to myself take it clear either you are about to make one more argument against intermarriage or you are going to settle the question forever so far as your case is concerned mother and i went to dinner together somewhat later than usual we attacked our food very bravely eyes down i glanced up inadvertently and the sight of tears on her cheeks released mine too i leaned forward and took her hand and we struggled with a sentence or two 
no tears i said be patient she answered next morning after the amma had dressed young alicia while the cheerful child was following me about the room with her eyes and talking merry baby talk i took her up and went earlier than usual to see mother i found her sitting up in bed she was dressed for the day and the blankets were rolled back against the side of the wall making a comfortable couch for her thinking of chan king i looked at the row of little cabinets extending across the back halfway up toward the canopy i remember chan king's telling me of the year when he was still small enough to stand under these fascinatingly carved cabinets where his mother stored her trinkets and toilet articles embroidery silks perfumes and the endless paraphernalia of her quiet life and of the pride he felt when he bumped his head one day and found that he must stoop to be comfortable wilfred was just high enough now to stand easily under the cabinets but in some mysterious fashion the little image of him presented at this moment to my fancy became that of the small far-away chan king whom i was forever recreating in my mind as i went about the house where he had lived his pleasant youth this morning i laid alicia on the bed near madame liang she bent over her and made a moi into the rosy face i was very much pleased when madame liang was unusually attentive to alicia though my sense of justice always reminded me that my own scotch mother would probably have made more of the boys but our alicia was the first daughter in two generations of my husband's family and even though the sons were of priceless value to the clan she was loved and cherished tenderly it seemed to me at times that the household was more fond of her than of all the boys together including madame springtime's young kyung song who filled the left wing of the compound with his shouts of glee as he played riding-horse on his precarious bamboo stool i remembered with amusement the western idea that daughters are unwelcome always in chinese families while madame liang patted the baby talking to her coaxingly i asked what she wished me to do she indicated on her dressing-table a box of stereoscopic views which i brought to her they formed a complete story but had become very much confused as i could read the foreign titles would i kindly arrange the pictures in proper sequence the ease and speed with which i accomplished this task won her instant approbation this was merely one of the numberless small things i did for her thereafter in my new estate i was in attendance on my mother during many hours of the day i walked with her in the garden in fine weather i sat with her and sewed threading needles as for my own mother and even helping her to make those marvellous small shoes that she fashioned so carefully to the form of her feet one day i told her how amazed i had been when i first learned from chan king that chinese wives made the family shoes but how readily i could understand when i saw the dainty embroidered footwear he referred to that shoemaking was indeed a womanly craft she and madame chow used to take great pride in making for themselves the most frivolous of shoes madame chow's were the smaller being barely two and a half inches long whereas those of my mother were twice that length and different in shape i discovered the reason for this madame chow clung tenaciously to the old style but mother had gradually let out her bandages and altered their arrangement keeping pace with the change that followed the abolition of the old custom i became deeply interested in the custom of foot-binding in shanghai all the pupils of my school and with certain notable exceptions the women of my social world had natural feet and the majority of them wore american pumps and oxford's or english boots 
bound feet, though I saw them frequently in public, seemed very remote. But now, save the girls of twelve and under, who had profited by the new order of things, the women among whom I lived all had bound feet. It may be worth noting, when one remembers how America, with its own great unwashed, jokes at the expense of the Chinese of whatever rank or station, that, in accordance with the fastidious cleanliness of upper-class Chinese, the bound feet were exquisitely cared for, and the narrow, white, specially woven bandages were changed every two or three days. As I watched the daintily shod women of my mother's household, I realized that never before had I appreciated, in reading the literature of my adopted country, the aptness of comparing the walk of a woman with bound feet to the grace of bamboo swaying in the breeze. Never had I suspected the charm attached to twinkling flashes of embroidery beneath a panelled, many-plated skirt my own number four feet assumed alarming proportions i grew positively ashamed of them one day as mother and i sat together in armchairs with a blackwood tea-table between us i placed my feet in line with hers and said sighing ah they look very bad indeed she waved a deprecating hand never mind she said with courtesy and truth they may not look so well, but they certainly walk better. Of course I was glad that the small Alicia belonged to young China, and would purchase no golden lilies with a cask of tears, as I had often read that every woman with bound feet must do. But I now decided that the cask must have been filled in the years of girlhood, for the women about me seemed to suffer no pain only an occasional numbness relieved by brisk massage from knee to ankle under the hands of a maid i was surprised at the ease and energy with which they got about merely balancing with small forward and backward steps when stopping unless they had a servant's arm or a cane for support I thought our mother infinitely superior in the grace and dignity of her carriage. Madame Springtime, who had slightly enlarged her feet at the command of her husband, moved slowly and with a lack of grace characteristic of the younger generation. Madame Chang moved ponderously and with difficulty. Madame Chow hurried with quick, fluttering steps. On occasion she would even run races with Alfred, our merry second son, now two and a half years old. She would catch his hand, lean forward, and hurry him the length of the hall, the two of them laughing gaily. Now and then I would fold my hands, balance on my heels, and essay a willow walk, to the great amusement of Mother and Madame Chow life went very evenly for me in my chinese mother's house after my husband's departure his father had not come home for his semi-annual visit and the second son was away again even the quiet mild-mannered third son who looked just like his mother and who used to bring me roses from the garden every day had sailed for the island port to take his place in the family business we were under a benevolent matriarchate in the snug compound among the brown hills now brightening to springtime green madame liang was infallibly generous and kind i never heard her speak sharply except occasionally to servants who had by their carelessness caused something to go amiss impeding the smooth progress of daily family life I used to watch her with interest as she directed the household affairs from the throne of her great bed. She rarely gave her orders at first hand, but would summon a relative or an upper servant, who would receive and pass them down to those for whom they were intended. This imparted to her orders an empress-like finality and importance. The servants gave her complete allegiance. 
she took great pride in conducting me through the complicated structure where generations of liangs had lived and died extending back from the main establishment was a series of smaller ones like it each with its own courtyard its main hall containing the family altar its private chambers opening on each side similar chains of homes within a home extended east and west at right angles to this central chain mother showed me the rooms she had occupied as a bride with the chamber where cheng king was born when the older madame liang ruled affairs with a firm yet kindly hand i felt deeply moved by all this more than ever a part of the family i made many small mistakes i know in my effort to practice the toleration industry and courtesy exemplified in that family group but mother unlike many of the oversensitive easily offended chinese women of her class was divinely patient she never asked of me anything that she deemed unfitting for me and she showed a wise discernment in all the small tasks she assigned i sometimes accompanied her to the temple or to the ancestral graves but only as a spectator her religious toleration required no compromise she wanted me to see where grandparents and great-grandparents were laid to rest she knew i was interested and filled with respect to madame springtime fell the task of caring for the family altar and keeping up the daily devotions before the sacred shrine this young wife was in every way so typical of the old-fashioned chinese woman trained but not educated disciplined but not broken that i found in her a continual source of interest she was naturally shy and silent but after a time we talked a little and one day she showed me her bridal trunks of white lacquer with red and gold decorations filled to the top with her bridal finery exquisitely folded and the clothes for her first child which had been provided by her parents as a part of her wedding outfit this latter custom of chang king's native province appealed to me it was typical of the many simplicities i found among my adopted people those small brilliant colored garments of padded silk and brocade and linen were symbols of hope good omens for happiness and a fruitful marriage accustomed as i was to falsely puritanic ideals concerning the important realities of life marriage and birth their frank attitude toward fundamentals their unquestioning acceptance of the facts of existence came as a pleasant surprise to me i liked also the curious contrast between their simple view of elemental things and the formality and rigor of their personal etiquette it is the manner of an old and ever cultivated race who have long since ceased building at the foundation and are now occupied with the decorations of life their scheme of daily living is based on the firm belief that the normal mode of human existence is family life to this end it must be preserved at any cost life cannot develop in discord if the amenities are worth anything at all they are worth preserving constantly and at whatever personal sacrifice life behind the arched gate was so pleasant and so filled with small daily occupations that i thought little of going about the village had no theatre on festal days performances were given by travelling troops on temporary stages in temples or private houses but we occasionally attended the theatre in the great city near by and when we had guests staying with us for several days they sometimes accompanied us we were rather an impressive sight i fancy borne at a brisk trot in half a dozen sedan chairs down the irregular path at dusk preceded and followed by men-servants carrying lanterns the children led a sheltered happy existence with servants and young relatives to amuse them indoors or without 
as the weather permitted they were liberally supplied by their indulgent grandmother with pocket-money in the form of handfuls of coppers instead of the strings of cash that sufficed an earlier generation from passing vendors they bought bows and arrows of brightly painted bamboo whistling birds and theatrical figures of coloured earthenware inflated rubber toys and an endless variety of rice flour cakes sesame seed confections peanut taffy and millet candy on festal days the choice was wider than ever with fluffy bunches of sugar wool fine spun syrup and brittle candy toys blown from molten taffy with all the glass blower's art in the form of lanterns birds and fish mounted on slender sticks at certain seasons there were huge fish made of bamboo frames paper covered and realistically painted which swam in a breeze with lazy grace or kites similarly fashioned to represent birds and dragons which winged upward in fascinating flight there was a limited foreign settlement in this same city and several of the american and british women came to call on me some of them were frankly curious to know how i had come through the ordeal by family as one of them expressed it though of course they were very tactful mother was much interested in these visitors many of whom if able to speak chinese i presented to her when they left she would often ask questions as to their nationality their husband's occupation the number of their children as for that question most of them confessed to one child or occasionally two but i shall never forget the call of a strikingly handsome auburn-haired woman and the conversation that followed her departure in reply to the usual inquiry i said no children at all but she has five dogs and has just bought in shanghai two more which are coming down on the next steamer no children at all and five seven dogs said mother in tones of horror and then we burst out laughing but quickly she sobered foreign women do not care for children she said i do i protested i like many children you said my mother with a smile are a chinese wife but happily my next caller was a sweet-faced american woman the proud mother of six two of whom she had brought with her so our national reputation was saved in these days i thought a great deal about intermarriage as a problem back in shanghai a returned student who visited in our home for several days had said to chang king afterward i almost married an american girl while i was in college i wish now i had been brave enough to do so at that time i felt very sorry for the unknown girl who had missed all the happiness that was coming to me and now i was more sure than ever of the true quality of my happiness there was no doubt at all on that score but i realized that many many ways in which everything might have been spoiled had my husband been less considerate less sincere and loyal had his family been less kindly and broad-minded had i myself been capricious and wilful or unable to adapt myself to surroundings i might every day have plumbed the depths of misery i decided that no rules could be made about intermarriage it was an individual problem as indeed all marriage must be so when a young girl back home in america wrote to me for advice believing herself in love with a chinese classmate and concluded you mrs liang must settle the question for me i answered as i should not have done a year earlier that is a question that you too alone are competent to settle no one can advise you safely for a mistake either way may result in lifelong unhappiness but i might venture to suggest that love strong enough to stand the test of intermarriage does not seek advice 
it is sure of itself in a household where only my eldest son and i spoke english my lingual struggles were unexpectedly mild chan king had left me a list of everyday phrases and my ear grew very keen in my constant efforts to understand the rapid speech going on around me all day long in a short while i could understand virtually everything said to me during the long conversations that mother and i had in the quiet of the evening we talked much of chan king and she displayed treasured relics of his boyhood a small jacket of deep red velvet a worn cap a silver toy and the identical schoolbook in which he began the study of english i loved them all loved her the more for cherishing them and was made supremely happy by being given a photograph of chan king at an earlier age than any he possessed she was very much interested in all our photographs too she was vastly amused at chan king arrayed for college theatricals and when i brought out pictures of myself at all ages of my parents and grandparents she traced family resemblances with an unerring perception sometimes we looked at magazines that chan king sent us from the capital or talked of various foreign customs i soon found it very easy to talk with her and with her help i learned also to read and write simple chinese characters for a very liberal-minded father had given her educational advantages enjoyed by few girls of her generation when the hands of her small ebony clock pointed to twelve she would touch my hand gently and say time for you to sleep but first i must write to chen king i would answer she would shake her finger at me with kindly caution it is too late she would answer you must sleep i would hold out firmly on this point but my mother if i do not write to chen king i cannot sleep she would assent then and next day i would carry the pages to show her for my letters to chen king and his voluminous responses were a source of much amusement to her i translated these letters as faithfully to her as my chinese would allow and in my letters always added messages dictated by her i was learning the romanized method of writing chinese which for our dialect has been remarkably developed and standardized mother was much interested when i showed her how to write familiar words with foreign letters and chen king always answered these messages in kind though his mother and he carried on a regular correspondence in the chinese characters those children write long letters to each other fifteen and twenty pages at a time she often told her friends with manifest delight beyond this personal companionship with my mother which i enjoyed very much there was no restraint put upon me in any way i was free to walk out alone to return calls and to shop in the city my own sense of fitness prompted me always to present myself at the door of my mother's apartment before i left the house to explain to her the nature of my errand and to ask for her approval accepting the little formality for the courtesy it was she never once demurred she was accustomed to this respect and i saw no reason for withholding it all the invitations i received from acquaintances either foreign or chinese i declined or accepted as she advised because i relied upon her unfailing knowledge of people and social customs twice during those months of chen king's absence death came near once it was a clever young boy an only son in whom high hopes had been centred and then the young girl who had accompanied mother to shanghai she was no servant in the ordinary sense but an orphaned distant relative of mother's madame liang was always kind and generous with her and when soon after her return from the trip to shanghai which had been a great event in her quiet life a promising marriage offer was made 
she was sent forth to her new home with a complete bridal outfit hearing at last of our presence in the family home she put on her wedding dress of pale green and came to see me her evident pleasure in the meeting touched me poignantly with bright eagerness she told me of her husband her kind mother-in-law with pride she described her tiny son after a gay hour with the children she left promising to come again but i never saw her afterward death took her abruptly from her happiness i began to think of death as something not so remote after all several times a group of us children and cousins and friends and servants made short chair trips into the hills the sight of thousands of graves their stones whitening the hillsides for miles in some places impressed me more and more with the comparative shortness of life scattered over many of these hills are curious monuments of stone called widow arches each one standing alone usually by a roadside in commemoration of a faithful wife who in ancient days killed herself at the death of her husband a widow who wished to make this sacrifice would after a short lapse of time announce her intention of committing suicide the members of her family would erect a high stage for her and invite relatives and friends to attend the ceremony at the chosen hour the lady would hang herself and a high stone arch would later be erected as a memorial of her devotion and heroism in the chinese family the widow who does not remarry receives honor and veneration second only to the mother-in-law with age she acquires added authority she is not forbidden to remarry but the conditions of second marriage are made difficult enough to discourage any but the most intrepid the children of her first husband remain in the house of his people and the family of her second husband do not give her any too cordial a welcome one naturally prefers free will in these things yet i had a whole-hearted sympathy with the idea of life widowhood long before i dreamed it was to be my portion painful as the widow arches was to me at first my convictions made the chinese view of them seem not unnatural though i knew the custom had been forbidden by imperial edict some two centuries earlier even in the days when chang king and i believed that our love would somehow give us earthly immortality the idea was strong in me that those who loved truly death could only extinguish the torch for a moment to relight it in the clearer flame of eternity then i cherished this thought in the background of my mind now i live by it for this reason too i have always found the chinese attitude toward the dead very comforting they never for a moment relinquish hold on their loved ones the death day anniversary is as festal an occasion as the day of birth the pageant of life marches without a break birth to death and beyond and birth again the generations endlessly touching mystical hands until the individual feels himself to be part of an endless procession that passes for a moment into a white light and out again feels himself touching those who came before and those who came after one of a long line bound together irrevocably with all their ethics of personal sacrifice and their preoccupation with the idea of eternity the chinese have no ascetic contempt for the material world and they earnestly desire and seek length of days among the varied symbols and characters used to express good wishes as health honor riches those for long life hold pre-eminence they are wrought in rings bracelets hair ornaments and are sewed into bridal garments and upon children's little coats and caps i always felt this enormous respect for life in all their daily customs the preparing of the baby clothes when the bride left her father's house 
the nurturing and strengthening of the clan with many children the reverent regard for the graves of the ancestors to whom the living owed their grace of existence on several occasions i accompanied my mother on her visits to the ancestral graves i remember the last time only a few days before chang king's return that i walked with her holding one of her hands while with the other she grasped her gold-headed cane she wore a light costume a plaited black skirt and lavender coat and lovely black kid shoes servants followed with her baskets of offerings we stood at a respectful distance in silence while she performed her rites all about were placed papers weighted down with small stones she knelt and clasping her hands devoutly repeated her prayers under her breath then assisted by a servant she burned the paper symbols of refreshment and replenishment for the dead firecrackers were exploded to clear the air of evil spirits and the ceremony was over as we returned to the village everywhere people called out to her from their doorways and she invariably replied with friendly courtesy in the outskirts we stopped for rest and a visit at the home of a cousin when we left many of the relatives and friends went with us a little way crying out repeatedly good-bye and come again come again soon i saw the sunlight on tiger mountain i smelled the saltness of the sea as we passed around the great boulders that hid them from our sight the modulated cadence of their come again come again soon floated to us it was the last time i should hear it as i was then and i did not even dream that it was so for a month i had been expecting the arrival of chan king his letters were always love letters and with added paragraphs saying that he was getting on well with his work and would have much to tell me of it when he came home at last a letter told us to expect him by a certain steamer on a certain day but schedules were still in confusion because of the war that steamer was delayed and chenking sailed for another port meaning to change there more delays followed more letters of explanation more delays again mother and i both became heartsick with hope deferred at last one morning worn out with watching i slept later than usual and on that morning chang king came home awakened out of a long drowse i heard a stir in the quiet house the clang of a gong a rush of padded footfalls in the outer hall happy voices mingled in greeting at the door of my mother's apartment i threw on my robe tucked alicia under my arm and ran across the room flinging the door open even as chan king had his hand raised to knock at the panel i saw him dimly in the wavering light he was smiling and behind him stood his mother also smiling each of us solemnly spoke the other's name trying to erase with a long look the memory of all those months of absence then he saw the baby liasia my thousand caddies of gold he said in chinese alicia smiled and held out her arms to him she recognizes him said mother in pleased surprise we three stood together a moment silently gathered round the child i felt myself more deeply absorbed into the clan a chinese woman dedicated anew heart and spirit to my adopted people later chan king explained to me the reason for his homecoming his legal service for the government had been completed and his expected appointment had come at last we were to return to america where he would be in the chinese consular service after a period in this work a bright future in the diplomatic field seemed assured it meant leaving behind my beloved china where i had firmly taken root but we agreed that the exile would be only for a few years 
and that we would return surely to our promised land there to enjoy our span of long life with honour now our leisurely existence was broken up to a degree almost immediately we set about preparations for our new life in america chan king looked forward with absorbing interest to the change almost as if he were going home my instant reaction was one of joy swiftly followed by sorrow at giving up things now loved and familiar i wanted to appear cheerful as a duty to those around me i did not want to seem too cheerful lest mother think me glad to go in this period at last i met my chinese father one beautiful day in early autumn chan king and i went down to the city returning in mid-afternoon as our chairs were set down before the entrance the gatekeeper announced to chan king his father's arrival i was filled with swift apprehension again chance had decided my costume i was wearing not the conservative chinese garb in which i had met my mother but a frilly american dress of blue and white summer silk a white lace hat with black velvet and pink rosebuds and white kid pumps chen king had on white flannels and a panama hat the latter he handed to a servant as also his cane as we entered the main room together a figure rose from beside mother to receive us i saw an elderly man of medium height with grim smooth-shaven face and gray hair he was wearing a long gown of deep blue silk with a black outer jacket and the usual round cap of black satin my husband first greeted him and then presented me while i stood uncertain there was a courteous inclination of the gray head the grimness of expression dissolved in a wonderfully winning smile and surprisingly as mother had done my chinese father extended his hand i felt that he was interpreting me in the light of all she had told him that his cordial hand-clasp and kindly words of welcome were his ratification of her judgment then with a courtly gesture he assigned me to his lately occupied chair beside mother while he and chen king took seats together opposite us mother smiled into my eyes with her happiest expression i felt that chen king's background was complete long before i had conceived of it as harsh and threatening but i had now proved it to be wholly kind and protecting at my recent fear of this last test i wondered and smiled father was much gratified at finding his sons able to converse fluently in his native speech he would gather them all about him for an hour at a time asking questions to test their practical knowledge or telling stories to amuse them alicia also delighted him at simple chinese commands she would now clasp her hands or fold them and bow profoundly mother was very proud of her wee granddaughter and would often say she is just as chang king was at her age and her husband would invariably assent with an indulgent smile there existed between these two conservative types though they were an evidence of mutual affection and respect of real companionship that touched me profoundly i was glad that father was to be with mother when chen king and i took ourselves and our three children from the home where according to the old chinese custom we all rightfully belonged the question of leaving one or more of our children there for a time was discussed one afternoon later under ordinary circumstances said father to chen king you would go alone as your brother does leaving your entire family with us at the very least you would allow one child to remain in your stead but of course your mother and i understand that these are not ordinary circumstances your wife is an american she has been considerate of our point of view in many ways more than we expected and in this matter we do not fail to consider hers which is no doubt your own as well 
we understand that according to the american view the children belong with their parents always we cannot of course deny your right to this manner of living but we want you to feel that if you can leave even one child with us we shall be very happy you understand what protection and care will be given it for a moment there was silence my heart was very full and even had it been my place to speak i should have been unable to do so mentally i pictured mother's loneliness at losing so many of her children vainly i tried to imagine our home in america with even one small face missing i watched my husband noted the tiny traces of conflict in his face impassive perhaps to the casual glance at last he spoke father mother he began earnestly we do indeed appreciate your great kindness and generosity you will understand that just as you understand most truly our situation we know that here with you our children would have many advantages that we perhaps cannot give them but which one could we leave to enjoy these advantages not wilfred for he is our eldest son on whom we place great dependence and alfred of us all he seems least fitted for the southern climate the summer heat has left him a little pale and listless he needs the sea voyage as for alicia she is the baby and our only daughter do not think us unmindful of all you have done but i fear we should not know how to make our home without our children after all it was evidently not unexpected they shook their heads a trifle ruefully at each other and then smiled very well father assented but this you must promise that at intervals whenever your work permits you will come back all of you and spend a year with us again do not let the children forget us nor their chinese speech in four years at most all come back together we promised readily mother and i repeating the phrase to each other in four more years all come back together our eyes were full of tears that night i said to my husband we should have left one of them but chang king was a clearer thinker and knew the truth of this situation better than i did which one he asked me significantly in a tone that made me see the essential hollowness of my protest on the sunday before our ship sailed chang king and i bade farewell to china in company with our parents and many other relatives we walked to the top of a very high hill where an old temple which commanded a magnificent view for miles around crouched contentedly among the rocks in the gray sunshine it was a temple of the three religions with huge stone images of confucius buddha and lao tse grouped in its outer court together chan king and i climbed to the crest of the terraced rock i looked about me down upon the proud bright little village alert and colorful on the hillside upon the scattering fertile patches in the midst of the barren mountains where tigers built their lairs the eternal hills swept the lowering clouded skies rolling away from us silent shadow-filled a surging love of the very soil under my feet a clinging to the earth of china overwhelmed me i wished to kneel down and kiss that beloved dust o chang king i said shaking with emotion this is home i wish we were not leaving even for a day we will come again soon he said in chinese and we will live here when we are old that evening we sat together in the quiet garden from mother's apartments came the sound of her young nephew's voice as he chanted his morrow's lessons we heard the subdued merriment of two little maids teasing each other in the hall beyond 
along the outer path a sedan chair passed with rhythmic sway the bamboo supports creaking a soft accompaniment to the pad pad of the bearer's sandaled feet from varying distances came the clang of a brass gong shuddering on the stillness the staccato sound of slender bamboo sticks shaken together in a cylindrical box the measured beat of a small drum rattle as the different street vendors announced their wares over the hills now purple in twilight the round moon swung leisurely into the violet sky strange breaths of incense wafted about us the sea breeze stirred the branches of a nearby dragon's eye tree where the ripening fruit balls tapped gently against each other like little swaying lanterns for long moments we sat in silence with clasped hands out of that silence my husband spoke softly words i had long yearned to hear absence margaret teaches many things once it showed you your own heart this time it has taught me to believe with you in the immortality of love like ours physically we may be separated at times but mentally spiritually you and i are one for all eternity a few days later we sailed for america the rest may be told in a few words for after all no words could adequately tell it a week after our arrival in america chen king was stricken with influenza for several years he had been in the shadow of a slow illness but with stout resistance and such buoyant recurring periods of good health that we had for a time almost forgotten that early and sinister threat but those years of struggle were all thrown into the balance against him when the decisive hour came after six days he died quietly with terrible implacability death closed over him we feared a sudden end, it is true, but were still incredulous of such a calamity. We gave each other what assurance we could. Our ultimate farewells were simple renewals of faith, a firmer tightening of our hands for our walk in darkness. Of all the world you are my love, he said, many times. More than any one else you have understood. You have been unfailing you have been my wife and almost as he spoke my arms held no longer my living beloved but only the clay where his spirit had been and would come no more so by visible evidences my history is finished but it has begun anew for me not as i wished not as i hoped but on a level that i can endure for i have my children and my memories and my home in china which waits with the gentle healing of sight and sound and place and i have learned that in love and only in love we can wring spiritual victory out of this defeat of the body end of my chinese marriage by may fran king narrated by danielle cartwright